power so I could hear your talk. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, um, then. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I just make a quick announcement. Uh, welcome back to the third day of Madison Money meeting. Um, uh, today we have four papers. Our first presenter is uh, Liang Wang. Yeah, you can start. Okay. Okay, I'll get started. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for showing up. And uh, I just want to say, you know, uh, actually a uh, happy Chinese New Year to every one of you, uh, because today exactly is the uh, Chinese New Year. So uh, we, <clears throat> the first paper uh, we're looking at, I'm going to present uh, this one joint work with uh, Chao from University of Missouri and uh, Janet from Bank of Canada. It's titled Credit Condition, Inflation and Unemployment. So the uh, main research question we're looking after for this project, we're trying to answer uh, two questions. The first one, we're trying to see uh, how does the uh, firm's financing condition, in particular, we mean um, firms being able to uh, pledge capital to acquire secure credit borrowing, okay? How does the firm's financing condition affect the labor market performance? And second, we want to look at how does this firm's financing condition affect the uh, Phillips curve? That's the trade-off between uh, inflation and the unemployment. Okay. So as is well known, uh, in recent years, we do observe a flattening Phillips curve. So uh, what I'm showing you here, uh, I use the uh, uh, HP filtered uh, CPI defined inflation versus unemployment rate. Okay. And we just look at um, three different time periods from 1980 to 1999, and then 2009 and 2010 to 2019. We see the slope of the Phillips curve gets uh, flattening, flattening. And also at first, uh, first time period, uh, this is actually upward sloping. And then for the second uh, two time periods I'm plotting here, they're actually uh, downward sloping. Okay, so we do see uh, uh, number one slope, absolute value of slope is changing. And number two uh, is also uh, going from positive to negative, okay? So uh, there are many different uh, explanations for this observation, okay? And this paper, we are going to look at the uh, explanation of this phenomena from the firm's credit condition, okay? So why do we look at that? So now I'm going to the, uh, the second picture where I'm gonna show you uh, some trend of several time, different time series, okay? So uh, in particular, look at the one with the um, blue curve, okay, blue color. So this one shows the uh, nine financial business debt as a share of total GDP, okay? And then the other one, uh, the red one is the three months treasury bill, secondary market rate, okay? That's what we use as the uh, interest rate, okay? So here you look at since 1980, okay, there's been a clear trend, upward trend of the uh, nine financial business debt. So I'm gonna call this the business debt ratio, okay, just for short, okay? So in the same time period, you see a clear downward trend of the uh, nominal interest rate, okay? So you see this kind of co-movement together with the movement of unemployment, okay? Where the unemployment has been slowly decreasing since the early 1980s, okay? And then of course we get hit by uh, uh, the financial crisis, so it goes up and then goes down again, okay? But this still, this trend continues. So. This kind of give us the idea, so we want to look at, okay, so in order to understand this movement of unemployment, okay, we want to take this problem from the angle of the changing of the firm's credit, uh, credit condition, okay, the firm's credit condition. So actually, we're going to argue that the firm's credit condition has been improving, okay, has been improving recently, which from the from data, from the picture we can show as a, a result is there's been more and more firm borrowing, on the other hand, uh, there's another reason could potentially contribute to the explanation is, a down, is the slowly decreasing nominal interest rate, okay? So we are going to present a model where we can take into account these two different factors. I want to see how much these are able to explain, okay, the downward trend of the unemployment in recent years, as well as the change in the slope of the Phillips curve, okay? So basically that's what we're trying to see here. And we're also going to take into account the changing of the firm's liquid asset, which is shown to you by the uh, dash yellow line. Okay, so it's a little bit light, what I can see. <clears throat> but the, the dash yellow line is the firm's liquid assets as a percentage of the total assets. Okay, so the dash yellow line is the liquid asset ratio. Okay, it's a less liquid asset ratio. We're also going to take that into account. Okay, So that's basically the key factors we're trying to look at in this model. Okay. In particular, we're going to provide a general global model 
where we're going to examine the effect of firm's secure credit condition, where you're going to use the uh, capital as the collateral to uh, against borrowing. Okay, we're going to look at the effect of this credit condition on unemployment, as well as the effect of this credit condition on the trade-off between unemployment and inflation, which is Phillips curve we're thinking about. And we have two main findings. The first one, we can show that when inflation increases, the real wage is going to decrease. At the same time, unemployment may rise or fall, which could critically depending on the firm's credit condition. Okay. And second, we can show that when the firm's credit condition improves, that's what we argue, that's what we observe uh, from the recent data, the real wage is going to increase and unemployment rate will fall. So that credit condition, improving credit condition contributes to the lower unemployment we observe from the data. And second, when credit condition improves, the slope of the Phillips curve between unemployment and inflation, that's a slope I showed you uh, in the second slide, it also gets, uh, it also decreases, it gets flatter and flatter and flatter, okay? So to understand the story we present, we're going to show you two key features of the model. We can call this two different channels, okay? The first one we're gonna call, this is a cash financing channel. There's a cash financing channel. So you're gonna see in the model, we have the producers. They're going to need cash or capital as collateral when they pay wages, okay? So one producer has such a choice. If there is a higher cost of holding cash, okay? Higher cost of holding cash, that implies that the firms face a lower expected surplus from posting a vacancy. Mm -hmm. So when that happens, a higher cost of holding cash will induce firms to post fewer vacancies. And this poses a positive relationship between inflation and unemployment, okay? So higher inflation induces higher unemployment from this extensive margin. And we, uh, we, we have some empirical evidence, not directly. We do uh, the empirical work in this paper, but this is a paper by uh, Bachata et al. This came on AEG Macro. It's a micro level empirical paper. It shows that when there's higher cash ratio in firms, it already goes together with a lower employment size of the firm. So we consider this as uh, evidence to support this first channel, cash financing channel. And there's a second channel that we're gonna present in this model, okay? We call this the wage bargaining channel. So it works like this. So when there's a higher cost of holding cash, the worker's outside option, the worker's outside option in the bargaining game between the worker and the firm in the labor market is gonna go down, okay? That, that means basically the value of being unemployed is gonna go down. So the value of having this employment, having this job is gonna be higher, okay? So this means the wage, bargain wage between the worker and the firm is gonna become lower, okay? That means the firm's effective surplus from this posting vacancy is higher, so the firms want to post more vacancies, okay? And this channel implies that there's a negative relationship between inflation and unemployment. So higher cost of holding cash, higher cost of holding liquidity, okay? Implies actually more vacancies and a lower level of unemployment. And also we can find some empirical evidence to uh, indirectly support this channel by showing that when there's a higher inflation, there's actually a lower real wage growth or even the real wage is decreasing, okay? It's kind of a shows, uh, sort of a provide evidence to support this channel, okay? So, uh, for the time's sake, I won't go into uh, the literature, but basically uh, there are different, um, I mean, this cannot be a extensive, this cannot be a ex exclusive list. So we still have actually many, many papers looking at this liquidity and firm level liquidity. Also many papers looking at exa uh, examining the uh, consumer side liquidity and trying to understand how much this is helping us to understand the movement in unemployment or the change in the Phillips curve, the slope of Phillips curve. In particular, our discussion, Zach, uh, he has a RED paper in 2000, uh, 2014, exactly looking at the consumer side of the credit. But here, what we're trying to focus is on the firm side, okay? And also want to shed some lights on the slope, on the trade-off between inflation and unemployment. So I'm gonna jump into the model. So we have infinite lift workers, which is measure one. 
and we have firms, which has a large matter, and we're going to allow free entry for the firms. And each time period, we have three different markets. They convene sequentially. So the first one, we look at the uh, labor market. So in the labor market, we have a bunch of active firms and active workers where they already met. Okay, they already met, so they already get into matches, and they're going to produce with the production function, and where one unit of labor plus capital are the input. Okay, and when they uh, after do that production, the firms they're going to use either cash or capital as collateral pay, to pay workers' wage. And also, we have a bunch of unemployed workers and vacant firms. They're going to meet bilaterally, and they're going to bargain for wage. The matching technology in this market is given by the M function. Okay, and there's a cost of posting a vacancy, and there's also exogenous job separation. The second market is a decentralized market, it's a frictional market where agents need to use the uh, money, okay, use money or use wage as a payment to facilitate trade. So in this market, firms produce a second kind of good, okay, second kind of good quantity Q using a linear uh, transformation technology from this uh, first kind of good X. And the workers are going to buy the second, uh, second good Q because they'll either pay with cash or wage, they get utility, okay, and also in this market, there's not a matching friction, and the uh, the firms and workers are going to determine the price use collide bargaining. Finally, we have the centralized market where all agents trade in this uh, frictionless market, and they're going to adjust monetary balance, adjust capital holdings, etc. Okay. The money policy rule is very simple. Okay. So here's the timeline. So here's the timeline. So because of time's sake, I won't give you the detailed value functions for everything. So I'm going to explain a little bit more on the timeline so you understand the agent decision problem. So in the labor market, uh, if the uh, worker is not matched, okay, if the worker is unemployed, the worker is going to match with the vacancies and they're going to negotiate a wage. After they get into a match, they're going to produce in the, in the next time period. Okay, so there's a standard like to sit out for one period after they get matched and start producing from the next period. So when, for those already matched the firms and workers, they're going to produce this good X. This is a numerical good X. And then the firm is going to pay with either uh, cash or like a credit, which is secured by their capital using capital as collateral. So they're going to pay wage, either use M money or the credit secured uh, by capital. And there is a separation of shock at the end of the labor market, which I is given by S. I'm sorry? Let me ask a following question or make a comment. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. You know, most or many worker firm relationships are long-term relationships. Mm -hmm. you would they'd be able to, you know, when I get paid for teaching, it's not as though I'm gonna collateralize the loan from University of Wisconsin. Uh, mm -hmm. Credit seems to work pretty well because it's a long-term relationship. I mean, maybe for some firms, but you might wanna think about what fraction of the labor force actually need to get paid via collateral? Doesn't seem like a very high fraction based on introspection. Okay, I see, I see. They're saying we can uh, uh, like have a certain fraction of the trade, okay. Okay, thanks, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna keep going, yeah. I'm sorry this, uh, yeah, it's a little bit intermittent when I hear. Randy's voice. So then we uh, go to the uh, decentralized market and basically the firm will transform the uh, numeral good into the second good, okay? And then households and firms, they're going to uh, meet, they're going to bargain over that good. And then households pay with either uh, cash or with the wage bills they receive, <clears throat> excuse me, okay? Uh, finally, they go to the centralized market and firms gonna sell off the rest of the X that's not traded in the decentralized market and they're gonna adjust their money holdings and cap holdings, et cetera, okay? So I'm gonna go to mention those markets that I feel like interested and, and for you guys to know, okay? So for the workers problem, uh, it's really interesting. The, the most in interesting thing is in the decentralized market where we look at two different kinds of workers, okay? So first of all, there can be employed and unemployed workers, but really in this market, what matters is whether they come with a wage income or they don't come with a wage income. So if they don't come with a wage income, they can be matched. I mean, they can be employed and they start producing next period, but today they still just need to spend their cash. So this is the first type of workers come without wage income, okay? 
And they just basically solve this maximization problem choosing the queue, but they're constrained. They can only use cash. Okay, so Z0 uh, represents those workers who don't have a wage income. So they're gonna accumulate cash in, uh, before they enter into this market. And then you look at a worker with wage income. Okay, they're gonna choose to accumulate cash. Maybe we're gonna see whether Z1 is gonna be positive or zero. Okay, but at the same time, they do receive wage income where they can use in the decentralized market right now. So, <clears throat> Later for the theoretical results and the calibration, we're gonna consider workers make a ticket or leave it offer. So the worker's optimal choice then brings down to uh, the slice, okay? So basically uh, there can be two different optimal choice for the money holding. For the unpaid workers, they basically choose money uh, with the marginal cost equal to their marginal uh, utility. Okay, that's straightforward. But for the workers employed, okay? For the worker who currently employed means they get wage in this period, okay? then it really depends on how much is their wage, okay? How much is their wage? If they receive a lot of wage, like the wage level is very high, even then higher than the efficient quantity, okay, even then the payment they need to support efficient quantity, then they don't have to carry money into this market. But if the wage is not as high as efficient quantity, but greater than the quantity that you need to make, which is CQI, okay? In this case, these workers do don't need to carry wage into this market, okay? And the marginally, it's optimal for them not to carry cash, okay? So they're simply just going to use wage for the payment. They're only gonna cash if wage is so low, it's lower than CQI, in which case they do actually have a marginal gain of carrying cash, okay? In this case, the quantity will be the same as those who are unemployed, okay? And their decision problem pretty much the same. Look at this QI, uh, Q1 equal to QI. So that's the three different cases, okay? And then for the firm's problem, again, I think the uh, it's need to highlight the firm problem in the labor market. So, and here where I introduced the capital pledgeability parameter here, chi, as you can see from the constraint, okay? So this is the, uh, the first bullet point is the firm decision problem with a worker and a firm decides to choose wage W, okay? Uh, based on his money holding and also his capital level, his capital level. And he can pay at most from his capital levels, one minus delta, that's depreciation rate, times the capital pledgeability parameter times K, which is capital holding, which is, which is the capital holding. And for the firm without a worker, apparently the firm don't need to do anything, okay? Just need to decide uh, to post a vacancy. And then if you're lucky, they get matched. Not lucky, they're not matched. Okay. So I'm gonna, can I please um, follow up on my earlier comment? Mm -hmm. So the usual rationalization for this uh, pledgeability parameter chi is if mm -hmm. off the equilibrium path, the debtor reneges, I can seize, the, the creditor can seize a fraction of the capital. So this, in this model, I teach a course at University of Wisconsin. If they don't pay me, what, I take a building or a statue? So again, I, I'm not so sure that this is a very mm -hmm. general theory of firms, you know, liquidity problem when they're paying wages. It might be a bigger problem for firms when they're buying additional capital. It's going to be a problem for some firms with some of their workers, but you know, at the aggregate level, I don't know. I'm not sure that all workers are subject to this same kind of issue. I see. I see. Yeah. So really, what we're thinking here, um, this capital—I mean, sorry, this Kai thing times capital—we're thinking about this as a working capital uh, story. That's kind of the intuition we have in our mind. But of course here, I mean, I, I see what you're saying. Uh, as, as finally, when we model, actually we consider the only input where they need to use their uh, like working capital to purchase here is wage. And so, yeah, I, I totally see your point, it's a legitimate point, but really what we're thinking here is like working capital story. That's what we have in our mind. So they have to have some liquidity, you need to use it to buy the well, input for their product. It's just a label for what you're doing. It's not like it's a theoretical explanation, it's just a label, but anyway. Yeah. We agree, so you can go on. Okay. Yeah, sorry about this lagging, yeah. Okay, so the firm's uh, choice is also bring down to three different cases. Uh, of course, the firm doesn't uh, have a worker, so it's not matched with a worker, that's easy. Uh, he doesn't need to carry capital, doesn't need to carry cash. But for the firm who uh, is matched with a worker, okay, then a firm need to decide uh, the optimal level of capital versus cash holding. And there are gonna be three different scenarios. So I call this case one, two, and three. So in case one, uh, we call that the mixed payment case. Uh, mixed, mixed payment ca case is in a sense that the firm's gonna use both cash and capital pledged uh, lending to pay for the wage, okay? And this is, 
but you can see here the optimal ca capital holding is ki and the optimal cash holding is z hat so basically the cash holding for the firm is just to chip in for uh, whatever is left for the wage is not enough to pay with capital and chip in with cash but the second case we call that credit only case but it's tight in the sense that uh, the capital is uh, useful in terms of paying wage okay so on the margin the firm does not need to bring cash but the capital pledgeability is not the best case scenario meaning it's not able to uh, get the best le optimal level of capital holding where key star is the optimal level of capital holding defined over here okay and then the credit only case loose that's in third case is when okay sorry okay so somebody asked a question, it's kind of blocking my screen. So the third case, the credit only case loose where the uh, firms are accumulating the uh, efficient level of capital and the capital pledgeability is good enough. So the wage can be paid 100% with the secure uh, credit, okay. So eventually we close the model by half the collab bargaining between the worker and the firm. And also there's a free entry condition as well as the law of motion for the unemployment, okay. So we can show that uh, the result is pretty neat. We can prove that the existence and also uniqueness of equilibrium, as long as the entry cost of the firm is below a certain threshold, and that threshold depends on the nominal interest rate as well as the pledgeability parameter. Okay. So second, we have some results about the change the, of the credit condition. So if the economy is in the regime number one, which is the mixed payment case, or it's in the tight payment case, in those cases, you increase chi, okay? Increase chi is going to raise the pledgeability ability uh, of the capital. <clears throat> That's going to raise the wage income, as well as the tau, which is defined as market tightness, and lower unemployment rate. But if the economy is already in the loose payment case, apparently you already have enough pledgeability, okay? Increasing chi does not have any effect in equilibrium, okay? And as we increase chi from zero, okay? The economy is going to move from lower regime, which is the mixed payment regime, go through a tight payment regime and loose payment regime. So this pretty much defines, I mean, describes the how, eco, how the economy moves, okay, as we have a change in chi. So here the intuition is very straightforward. As increase chi, okay, this is, let's start with the first regime in the mixed payment regime. As the chi is increasing, the firm basically need less and less cash for wage payments as they can use more and more through the capital financing channel, okay. And that implies a lower wage financing cost for the firms. So their surplus firm match is increasing, okay? And this will pass on part of surplus to the, to the workers. So the wage is gonna go up. And because of the higher, uh, more vacancies being created, unemployment rate is gonna go down, okay? So higher chi leads to a lower unemployment rate. And a similar intuition, even though not the same, works in the second regime. And the second regime, remember that firms don't need to carry cash. So as chi increases, they need less and less capital for the reason of collateral for wage payment. So they can actually stop over accumulating more and more capital. So they will restore the efficient level of capital, okay? That means the capital productivity is gonna go up, implies a higher surplus for the firm, also lead to a higher wage for workers and a lower unemployment. So in general, increased uh, improved firm's credit condition is going, to, uh, is going to be beneficial for the workers in terms of wage and also lower unemployment. So once the economy is already in the loose scenario, loose payment scenario, the firms already have abundant credit. So in this case, you change chi doesn't really affect the equilibrium. The next two results uh, tells us about the effect of monetary policy. Okay. So as I increases, that's a cost of holding liquidity increases, W will decrease. But how does the unemployment change? That depends on which scenario the economy is. If the economy is in the regime number two, tight uh, payment condition, or regime number three, that's the uh, loose payment condition, unemployment is going to decrease in the cost of holding liquidity. But if the economy is already is in regime number one, that's a mixed payment con uh, mixed payment scenario when the firms use both cash and wage, uh, both cash and capital credit to pay for the wage, unemployment rate actually may go up or down with inflation. Okay. As I increases, the economy moves from lower regime to higher regime. This is as the same, same result we've seen from the last slides. So intuition here, exactly because of the two different channels. One of the channel only functions when firms have both uh, cash and credit to pay for the wage, and the other one only happens, uh, the other one is always there. So you have two channels working in the opposite directions. So the wage bargaining channel, as I explained, so as the cost of holding liquidity goes up, okay, the workers' benefit of employment goes up. 
so they're wa able to wa they're willing to accept a lower wage. This leads to the firm's surplus from uh, matching with the workers goes up. This leads to more vacancies being posted. That through the extensive margin effect, meaning unemployment rate is going to go down. Although this channel itself generates a downward sloping Phillips curve, even though we don't have you know number G or anything like that. Okay, and then the cash financing channel it works the opposite direction as the cost of holding liquidity goes up. The firm's wage financing costs go up, but this only happens if the firm needs to carry both cash and liquidity to pay for the wage and, and credit to pay for the wage. And that leads to the lower profit for the firms. Okay, so it's through the bargaining problem, the wage is going to go down and firms are going to post fewer vacancies. And this leads to a higher unemployment rate. So this channel itself uh, implies upward sloping Phillips curve. And the two channels together, okay, give us the result of uh, the employment rate can go either up or down when we are in the first regime, but go to the second or third regime, the employment rate is going to go down. Okay. So then I'm going to show you, yeah, so the remaining time I'm going to show you some uh, quantitative results. Uh, so first, I uh, calibrate this model and to the 1984 and 2007, and this time period, because I'm trying to use the uh, new M1 data series from the uh, Lucas Nicolelli data, and that's the uh, from 1984 to 2016, but we are looking at the time period before the financial crisis. So what we're trying to do is we calibrate the model to the period from 1984 to 2007 before the financial crisis. And then we try to use the calibrated parameter from this time period to see how much the model is able to explain the change in unemployment before this time period and after the financial crisis. Okay, so the result I'm going to show you is going to be a comparison between this time period and the time period before this uh, 1984 to 2007. And uh, one quick thing about the calibration, uh, one thing is right now the leader, we choose leader to be zero falling Scheimer, but we understand there are actually different takes on how much the leader should be, okay? And we're trying different values. And the second thing is uh, for those parameters on top of this uh, double line. I have to make a comment here. I say this whenever somebody does what you just did, and I'm hoping the profession will ultimately catch on. So Scheimer did not invent the number zero. Okay. Nor did he invent 0.45. The idea of mm -hmm. calibration in modern times is not to pick parameters out of the literature, but to pick parameters to match targets in the data. So, yeah, so zero, yeah, I mean, you might say in a footnote that Scheimer picked an equally silly value for leisure, but you don't mm -hmm. want to you don't want to somehow give him. And this is not this is not jealousy or anything. It's just not good science to think that Scheimer is responsible for zero being the value of leisure. Okay. Well, yeah. Get rid of the names yeah. in this table. They don't belong there. Everybody else, take note of that, please. Uh, it's actually you your name is. Want, I'm telling you, it pisses me off. If, even if you quote Chris and I, I still don't like it. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm about to say. This is crazy. Zero, your name I mean, here. Ian Fleming <laughs> invented 007, not Aroba Waller, right? So no names are allowed to go in the table. Okay, okay, yeah. So, uh, uh, but yeah, okay, fair enough. So uh, so basically the, the values uh, on top of the double lines are directly pinned, can be directly pinned down from targets and for the other parameters below the double line and they're just uh, picked uh, jointly together to minimize the uh, difference between the target and the model predicted statistics, okay? And so here is the, uh, predicted money demand function by the model. And so these are the data points from 1984, 2007. And uh, so the first, first of all, the money demand curve has a kink. And this is because the model switch from one regime to the other. So as the uh, nominal interest rate keeps going up, the cost of liquidity goes up. At one point in time, the firms will stop using cash as payment for wage, but they're gonna to switch to credit. So that's what's represented by this thing over here. And also you see the money demand sort of uh, get flattened. So it's actually de decreased, okay? That's because the, the firm's cash holding is going to zero after the certain point, okay? And also for the part on the left where the money demand is tilted up, okay? And that's actually consistent with the money demand data after 2007, where we are in the low inflation, well, low interest rate and low inflation time period. All those data points actually show up here towards this axis. Okay. And we also plot the welfare cost of inflation for our economy. Okay. So right now I'm using um, zero inflation as the benchmark, okay, just to compare the values with you know uh Douglas and Ryan and Lucas. 
So uh, again, two points to take away from here. First one, you also see a kink, okay? And after a kink, the slope of the uh, welfare cost function becomes a flatter, okay? And this is the kink where the firm's going to uh, stop using cash as payment for their wage. So the liquidity cost of inflation will actually become smaller in terms of the magnitude. That's number one. And number two, actually, if you notice the 10% of inflation, uh, welfare cost of 10% inflation in our economy is only about like 0.7% of consumption. So I'm using the same compensating consumption measure for welfare cost. Uh, so actually this result is a bit surprising at first, because here we actually have uh, many frictions. If you think about it, we have the liquidity frictions as standard in Lagos for the right about the, uh, the decentralized market trading, even though right now we don't have a Nash bargaining in that, uh, in that uh, market. We also have the labor market frictions, and we also have the capital investment decisions being distorted from optimal. But still, uh, the welfare cost of inflation is not very big, okay? So the next picture, what I'm trying to do here, uh, this exercise is actually similar to what uh, Zach did in their RED paper. So we are standing in the standpoint of 90, uh, 1984 to 2007. So we use the average data, average point data points in this time period to pin down the parameters. And now we're trying to say, okay, so now we're going to adjust the parameters to fit the debt ratio in the time period of 1980 to 1984. That's before this time period. And, and over there in the period of 1984 and uh, 90 to 90, 1980 to 1984, it has the uh, feature of a lower debt ratio. It also has a feature of a higher nominal interest rate. So what we're going to do, uh, we're going to adjust a parameter value chi and i so that the model is able to predict the debt ratio that's consistent with the value in 1984, 90 to, 1980 to 1984, okay? And then we see when we do this adjustment of parameters, how much percentage change in liquidity asset ratio and how much percentage change in unemployment. So the first column you see here, is the baseline model. These are the values, okay? These are the current values in the baseline calibration, okay? Yeah, and sorry course, to interrupt, uh, four minutes. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you. So uh, this is the baseline value of, uh, yes, the baseline value of current calibration. And we need two changes. We need two changes to bring the debt ratio to the target rate of 9080 to 9084, okay? One is we need to decrease chi, and the second one, we're going to raise the interest rate to the 9080 to 9084 level. So the second column here, when I say chi is decreasing, this means how much of the debt ratio liquid asset or employment is changing from the baseline value due to the change in chi only. And the third column, when, uh, when I show an increase in nominal interest rate, is how much is the change of those three statistics due to a change in the nominal interest rate only. And the both, uh, meaning when I change both chi and i, how much is going to be the percentage change from the baseline value for debt ratio liquid asset employment? The last one is the change percentage change in the real data. Okay, percent change in the real data. Of course, the first one, the first uh, the first row, I'm able to hit exactly 13.3 percent of the data because that's how I I use it to pin down the change in the uh, uh, in the value of chi. Okay, but during the breakdown, you can see that uh, from the baseline value to the uh, 1980 to 1984 value. A larger change is brought in by chi, okay, which is actually brings down, going the same direction as the change in the real data. Well, nominal interest rate works in the opposite direction, and the magnitude of that change is actually smaller. And then when I look at the change in uh, liquidity asset ratio and unemployment rate, actually the channels in the model is doing less, uh, uh, not as good job as trying to explain the change in debt ratio, okay. But takeaway here is you can always see, <clears throat> excuse me, when we look at the two factors, how do how does this change? How do this change affect the change in unemployment rate? So that uh, the change the change in unemployment rate is caused a bigger change is caused by the change in chi, which is the capital pledgeability uh, parameter, and a smaller change in terms of size is caused by the change in nominal interest rate. When we look at the liquid asset change, a larger change is caused by the change in the nominal interest rate. So apparently, the liquid asset is more sensitive to the change in nominal interest rate. Okay, that's the breakdown we try to look at. Uh, from the different channels. Um, how much time do I have, Shansing? Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. So, um, so in the next two pictures, I show you how the, uh, when I vary uh, the chain, when I vary the value of chi, and when I value the, uh, when I vary the value of nominal interest rate. So this picture shows when uh, chi goes from 
uh, 0 to 0 0.6. When I go from 0 to 0 0.6, and you can clearly see the change, the transition of the three different regimes. Okay, So the first one is when the firm need to use both cash and capital uh, as a payment for wage. And in this, in this part, you can see the capital, invest, the capital investment is actually increasing with Kai. And then it starts to decrease. That's when we enter into the second regime. And eventually, capital level is held in constant at the optimal level. That's when the firms have abundant credit condition to pay for the wage. Okay. And now we go to uh, this picture is showing you the uh, change of the equilibrium allocations when I vary the, uh, the inflation rate or nominal interest rate from zero to a little bit higher than 10%. Okay. A little bit higher than 10%. So what actually we see here is as you increase the cost of holding liquidity, capital investment actually goes up and the labor market output, this is total output of the economy is actually also going up, okay? And on the same, on the same time, the trade in the decentralized market, because they're being constrained by liquidity, uh, hold, holdings of the consumers, it's actually going down as the cost of liquidity goes up, okay? So uh, you look at it here, this picture actually shows that uh, from the welfare cost of inflation, when the inflation, when the nominal interest rate is very close to zero, close to, sorry, when the nominal interest rate is close to zero, that's when the economy is close to the Freeman rule, actually, we actually have a component that the welfare is actually increasing with the change in nominal interest rate. That's through the extensive margin of the firm decision in the labor market. So here we actually have different channels of the welfare cost, okay? So at first, the welfare actually may be increasing from certain channels through the labor market. On the other hand, we also have the decreasing welfare, uh, decreasing welfare, that's the increased welfare cost from the decentralized market trade. So this picture, uh, trying to explain what the uh, Phillips yeah, curve looks like. Kind of uh, running out of time. Could you wrap up maybe? Yes, um... wrap up this last slide, sorry, yeah. So what I'm showing you here is the blue line is the, uh, is the Phillips curve generated by the model using the calibrated parameter, chi. And then I change chi from the 0 0.27, that's the calibrated value, to 25, 20, 15, and uh, 0 0.05. So what you can see here is the trade-off between inflation and uh, unemployment rate crucially depends on the firm's credit condition. And the model is able to replicate positive uh, Phillips curve and also downward sloping Phillips curve. And as chi increases, the flip curve is getting flatter and flatter. And that's one of the facts we're trying to explain in the introduction of this model. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our discussant is Zach Bissun. Thanks, Leon. Can you stop sharing your screen? Oh, sorry. I didn't know I had to. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Hope you can see my screen. Let me know if you can't. So thank you very much for the um, organizers for having me discuss this paper. Um, I was you know, obviously really interested in the topic. As I mentioned, I, you know, I have some work uh, that has thought a lot about you know, the underlying connection between inflation and unemployment. Oops. So let me start off. Right, so, so you know, what's the broad goal of the paper? Um, I think Leon ex explained it well. It's really to understand some underlying mechanisms where we get from inflation to unemployment, really thinking about that connection in the long run. So, you know, certainly the paper only studies yeah, um, long, you know, steady states. Um, also, we kind of know, you know, and this is more of a critique of the, of the motivation, you know, it's really difficult to kind of look at Phillips curves, which, which might be really being driven by short run phenomena and kind of take that along to sort of think about that the paper has big implications for the for the short run. However, that's not to say I think, you know, the, the motivation of study, understanding these long term uh, relationships and mechanisms is incredibly important. Um, it's an important in its own right. And it's also important because it certainly might influence that short run relationship. I just don't really find that a lot of the Phillips curve discussion, you know, especially related to the large, you know, big literature on on kind of short run Phillips curves, is, is that helpful? Um, but clearly, the motivation is is nice. So, what's kind of the key takeaway of you know what they come to in the paper? Uh, and that's really that inflation can either have a positive or a negative impact on long run unemployment, and that both the direction and the strength of that relationship depends on the availability of credit, and they're kind of focusing on on firms credit. Now, this is in the context of a model of unemployment, you know, that's that's well founded now more than Pissarides. And we kind of know how long run unemployment works in that model It's pretty simple. Firms have some value of a lifetime value of a filled vacancy or you know, sorry, of a filled job. Um, as that lifetime value fluctuates and it, you know, as a function of inflation that there's a one-to-one -one mapping from that value to unemployment. So if, 
the value of a filled vacancy rises, unemployment's going to fall, and vice versa. So understanding which one of these directions is going to win out really boils down to understanding who in the economy between the employed, the unemployed, and firms bears the opportunity cost of holding wealth, bears the inflation tax. Now, this is a really interesting question. It's clearly kind of a, a question that our, our literature and the models we work with is, is you know, well formulated to understand. It doesn't just depend on, you know, by looking at the data and trying to understand who holds the liquid wealth. You know, we know from tax incidents, just because you tax, you know, one, one entity that that isn't passed through to other entities. It also depends on, you know, how is liquidity in the economy, you know, liquid wealth, what trades and surpluses do those uh, liquid balances affect? How are those surpluses split? How do we determine price setting? All right, how much can, can one entity pass on that inflation tax to another entity? Uh, and then what this paper is interested in, you know, in terms of credit, is also understanding, you know, who in the economy has access, I'll call it technologies. This is kind of, you know, you know, a certain commitment power, collateralizability of your other assets. Let me call them technologies to avoid that inflation tax. All these details really, really matter. Uh, and this paper is trying to sort of work out what, you know, what some of those details are. Okay, let me give some context about you know, where the paper is coming from. Uh, so they're really building off this paper by, by Alex Guido and Randy uh, in the 2011 AER. And I kind of explain it's sort of building, you know, for, you know, building Lagos right into this Morton's and Pissarides model. Um, and they really focus on this one channel that if you tax liquid wealth, Consumers are going to be the ones in the model, just like Lagos Wright, holding liquidity to purchase goods, increasing the inflation tax, decreases real balances, and that affects uh, a firm's output, you know, realized output through those liquidity constraints. So inflation is going to decrease the lifetime value of a filled job, and that increases unemployment. And they get that that you know uh, um, uh, that direction only. Now they, they also have a actually they have multiple equilibrium in, in the model. If you look at the bad equilibrium, you could get the other direction. Um, but let's say we're not going to focus on that one now. Now what this paper is doing is introducing that um, it's not just workers that have that are that might be holding liquidity. It's also firms, uh, and that the employed can economize on real balances. And why can they do that? Is because firms in part can save for them. Um, but not just save for them in terms of liquid wealth, can also save uh, using their credit technology. Um, so the extent to which the employed can economize, um, no, sorry, there, depends exactly on how much those firms need to hold liquid wealth for themselves, um, which means that the cost of losing your job or you know, the outside option of not being employed is not just going to be a function of that you, you know, lose income, you go from earning some wages to earning some unemployment benefits, but it's also going to uh, um, be a function of the fact that now you might have to hold more liquid wealth uh, in order to compensate for not having access to that credit technology that your firm is providing you. Okay, and that's exactly the reason why in this paper they could get this other direction, and if it's strong enough, can overturn this result that inflation leads to higher unemployment. Okay. So let me kind of quickly walk through the model. You know, Leon, I thought did a pretty good job at explaining it. And I, I just want to point out some really key assumptions that I, I think are important. So I'll try to go relatively fast here. Um, we, we know the model. It's Lagos, right? They build in this Morton's and Pissarides model. Um, there's workers, sort of workers slash consumers. There's firms slash sellers. Um, the employed are going to hold some liquidity. Uh, potentially, they get paid wages. It's a little bit confusing some of the language in the paper you say, you know, they use wages to finance uh, their consumption, right? But what's important is that wages are this combination of real balances that, the, that, that firms have to hold ex ante, uh, and then these, these promises, right? So I call it D, I kind of think it's natural instead of thinking about what's actually trading or claims on capital, but what are, what's trading are, are firms promises. Those promises are, are enforced by this collateral. So the firms that are accepting this in the, in the DM can then go to the market. They have this promise that's backed up by collateral and then, and then they could use that promise to con consume in the centralized market. Okay, I think that's a more natural way to think about it. Now the unemployed don't have these promises. They only have to finance this, this DM consumption by holding liquid wealth. So those may potentially be, be different. 
Um, and again, this is kind of the important point of the paper, the fact that those two liquidity positions are different, that, that already departs from what um, Berenson and Minzio Wright do, right? In, in that paper, both the employed and the unemployed, not only do they, they, they have the same liquidity demand, um, but they're gonna hold the exact same liquid wealth because they don't have any differences in access. There's no credit, things like that. Okay, so farms are gonna hold some capital, they may hold some money, and then they produce this output that there's this linear technology to transfer them either to CM or DM consumption. Um, uh, Leon discussed the timing. Uh, you know, the one thing to point out here is that although they mentioned that wages are negotiated at the beginning of the labor market, I, I actually don't think that's true. I think what they really have are that wages are kind of jointly negotiated simultaneously as firms and workers are choosing their portfolio decision. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna make a comment later that that actually kind of matters. Um, trying to remember our time. Okay, I wanna get to my comments. Let me just kind of, you know, ex explain the key uh, mechanics. You know, the liquidity constraints, you know, we should be familiar with. Um, if you go to the bottom, there's a liquidity constraint in the decentralized market, right? Consumers need some liquid, uh, um, 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 some liquidity either through real balances by what they save or through a part of the liquidity that they're getting through these wage payments um, that are paid in the, the, the beginning of the period in the labor market or through these promises that firms have. And then firms have these liquidity constraints that they can't transfer more promises than they, they, they have the, in terms of collateral value uh, or their liquid wealth. Okay. Now, you know, the important, there's really two kind of key equations to understand why they get this relationship is that just, just understanding how inflation is affecting the surplus, uh, uh, the, the job surplus for the worker and the job surplus for the firm. Um, now, instead of kind of going through these, you know, portfolio decision, uh, if we look at the bottom equation, what we see is that when you're unemployed, um, the intuition is that you're just acting like a logo strike consumer, right? Uh, you respond to the inflation tax, you hold less liquid wealth, that's going to affect your consumption. Um, now, if you're employed, you understand that you could avoid the inflation tax, right? Uh, by partly using these wages, uh, and wages are in part paid, again, paid, you know, uh, uh, liquid wealth at the beginning of the period, which you're not subject to, you know, you don't have to, the worker doesn't have to say, they're not subject directly to the inflation tax, uh, and then these capital, the, these promised payments. So in the surplus, what do you get? What's the, what's the you know, the, the opportunity cost of losing, or sorry, the cost of, of losing your job? Well, there's really two key components, right? Uh, that first component that we have here, right, that's the change in the surplus you're going to get in the decentralized market, moving from employment to unemployment, uh, and then the other thing that the gain that you get from a job is the fact that, that you don't have to save as much liquid wealth, okay? And what you can work out is that the, the, work, the worker's job surplus is increasing uh, in the nominal interest rate or in inflation, um, and that's given a wage. So fixed wages, if you increase inflation, they say, well, now it's more costly to enter into unemployment because I don't have access to that credit technology that I'm getting through this, this negotiation with the firm. But again, this is all gonna be part of that wage negotiation of the firm. On the other side, it's, it's exactly the opposite. So instead of kind of, again, going through all this stuff, um, what you can show is that the firm's job surplus is decreasing in the nominal interest rate. Why do you get that? There's kind of two channels there. One is it's directly impacting uh, both how much liquidity they hold uh, in terms of uh, real balances. And it's also affecting because they uh, their their capital holdings because they can they may over accumulate capital because they understand it's valuable uh, um, uh, to give workers as as liquidity. Okay, so both of those directions, inflation de increases workers surplus, decreases firm surplus, is going to push wages down as inflation goes up. Right, those two forces work in the same direction. If we then look map back to how does that map to unemployment? Well, wages are, are still go, are, are, are going to be going down. It's not obvious that unemployment is going to be right. It's not obvious that's that's good for firms, even though they're um, they're paying less wages. It depends on these two forces, right? So the, the first part of the value of a filled job we have here, right? That's decreasing in inflation, but wages are also decreasing in inflation, and now it's a horse race, right? So it's a quantitative question which one of these wins out. And I, I think I kind of explained the intuition for why uh, Kai is important. Let me speed up a little bit. So, so they, here they're showing kind of what, you know, this, this long run Phillips curve. 
And you can see that the collateral value, you know, as the collateral value of your capital increases, um, that's leading to a more negative relationship. Okay, so I really want to make three three comments on the paper. The first comment is more of an observation. And I think it's just a better way to frame, you know, the real story of what you're doing. I, I think the mechanism at the end of the day is really about the collateral value of employment, right? The credit value of having a job versus not having a job. Right? Firms possess this technology; they could use their capital as collateral uh, to avoid, you know, uh, uh, the inflation tax. Now, how much can firms pass along those savings? or how much firms have to pass along those savings to worker, workers depends on the extent that the firm has bargaining power in the labor market. If the firm has a lot of bargaining power, they don't have to pass on much of those savings to workers and that's gonna weaken your effect uh, and, and, and vice versa. Now, if that's kind of the way we think about the model, then it's really not clear to me how much of this really depends on, on access to credit of the firm or the fact that there's this different difference in access to credit between employed, the employed and the unemployed. Right, they're going to give you really similar mechanism, right? Really similar stories at the end of the day, right? So another way to kind of frame it is: imagine that you know the increase in credit availability is all happening on the consumer side. You know, firms have this commitment power to pay numeraire in the centralized market. You know, that, that that's our usual assumption in these models, um, and workers can then use those firms' promises to pay wages in numeraire in the centralized market as collateral in the decentralized market. Okay, kind of two things. I'll finish in in, in maybe you know one, one and a half minutes. Um, if you model it that way, you still get this difference in terms of liquidity between the employed and the unemployed. And, and it's something I explored in, in, in this kind of shameless, shameless self-promotion. I explored in my job market paper, kind of thinking about, you know, the, uh, the enforceability or, or, or the, the, the solvency between the employed and the unemployed. Um, and, and also explored a little bit with Guillaume and, and Tai Wei thinking about kind of self-fulfilling equilibria where the employee, the unemployed may have, have lower credit limits. So I, I, this really isn't a critique I find of the paper. In fact, I, I think it really strengthens the argument for why the channel might be strong because it's not necessarily just relying on, on firm credit. It's really about, you know, this, this collateral value of having employment. Now, what I want to push the authors to kind of think about are, are really two things. One, as I mentioned in, in that first slide, the story here is all about how these surpluses are shared. So it's all about the pricing mechanisms, both in the labor market and in the product market. So it's kind of a starting point, and they, and they do this in the paper, Leon didn't have time to get to it today, is instead of assuming that, that firms are price takers in product markets, uh, they assume that firms have some bargaining power there, some market power. That's certainly important to, to model, right? If firms uh, uh, possess sufficient bargaining power in, in product markets, in, this, in the decentralized market, um, then this cash financing channel seems to become stronger. Now, does it completely outweigh the other effect? It's not clear, but it's certainly quantitatively because at the end of the day, you're doing a horse race. That's what's really important. Um, the second thing, and this is what I mean by the timing of your wage assumption is really important, is it's not just the timing, but the commitment power in that, you know, when those portfolio decisions of workers and firms is very important. Right, so you might imagine that, well, workers certainly understand that their liquid wealth position is affecting their outside options. So if you assume that their portfolio decision happens before those, that wage negotiation, they naturally wanna hold more liquid wealth in order to improve their outside options, which improves, improves their wage, uh, um, uh, improves their wage. Firms are doing the exact opposite, right? Firms are holding less capital and less liquid wealth because that improves their outside option. Uh, uh, in the negotiation. Now that's gonna work kind of against your story. Uh, I don't think it's gonna cancel out the story, but then of course, you know, again, quantitatively, that's what's, uh, that's what's important. Okay, my last slide and then, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm running over. Um, the last slide, it, you know, in some sense it's a cheap shot, but I, I think it's actually really important here. It's not, it's not important in all of our models, but this is really important, is to what extent do we believe that there's this big inflation cost when you lose your job? That's kind of the key thing, right? And the model is capturing some fact in the data that I, that I think actually exists is that there's a component of liquidity demand that's inelastic to income. That when you lose your job, yes, you might, you might demand less liquidity for some reason, but it's still relatively inelastic. But in the model, it's perfectly inelastic, meaning kind of the first best DM consumption and then the amount of liquidity that they need to afford that is the same between the employed and the unemployed. I think that, that's certainly not true 
And that's where modeling things like precautionary unemployment, you know, unemployment risk and precautionary savings to ensure against unemployment risk is really going to push that mechanism in the opposite direction, right? We understand the, un the unemployed are right, now just saving out of their liquid wealth um, when they become unemployed. So that naturally they're, they're having to experience less of this inflation, uh, uh, this inflation tax. Um, okay, let, let me stop there. Sorry, sorry, I ran over. I have a bunch of other kind of comments that I'll, I'll send the authors uh, separately. Okay, thank you, Zach. Uh, Liang, do, do you want to respond to Zach first? Then we will open for Q and A. Uh, yeah, I mean, really uh, briefly, uh, I think Zach gives very good comments and good points. And some of those points we actually uh, talk about, but just uh, like like you said, some of the things we don't have time to present today. But for example, like uh, I think you mentioned the um, the cash financing channel uh, that actually reinforced by allowing the decentralized market, I mean, firms to have a bargaining power decentralized market, right? So that's actually absolutely true. So we uh, actually uh, consider that, I mean, if I, sorry, I call names again, but we can call that like a Bearson uh, BMW channel. So they actually have that thing in their in their paper. So by having the firms uh, taking away part of the uh, profit from the decentralized market trade, so if we do allow that, uh, what you said is completely true. It's like the reinforcing on the cash financing channel. But even though even though the cash financing channel is slightly different, because that uh, I mean the, the direction of the uh, effect will be the same, and it will make actually the uh, the force that drives the upward sloping Phillips curve that's a positive trade off to be stronger and uh, mitigate the downward sloping uh, Phillips curve. And the last thing you said about the uh, the inelastic liquidity demand that's completely true. So we are kind of like make it a I mean, how do I say this? It's like, it's, it's pretty simple here right now. So they can either have a job or they don't have a job then there's nothing they can rely on. I mean, uh, I don't know what we can do if we only give them money demand instead of giving them some other choices, a little bit like, you know, other functions, either other functions money, like precautional saving, like what you're saying, or it can be they hold some other assets, for example, I mean, for the households, that would certainly make the uh, demand for liquidity would be different. But right now, since this like a basically like a like a zero one thing for the unemployed, right? They either hold cash or no cash. So, so, so from that dimension, I'm not sure like how much we can do, yeah, about that. Can I make another comment? A comment on Zach. So Zach asked the question of Z or Z, as we say in Canada, is higher for the unemployed. Um, not in absolute terms, but it probably is as a fraction of their permanent income. Now this suggests you might want to have some heterogeneity in the model. And actually heterogeneity was, is really important in these kind of models. So if you look at your, your diagrams, you'll see the regime switch, right? Everything is nice and smooth. Then you hit a point in the nominal interest rate where there's a kink because mm -hmm. you go, I mean, for example, from a monetary to a non-monetary program, when agents in one hand use cash and on the other hand, they don't. But if you had a model with heterogeneity, and I learned this from working with Venki on some stuff, it comes up all the time. If you had heterogeneity, you get a smooth transition as fewer and fewer of the agents were liquidity constrained, mm -hmm. as opposed to the representative agent going from zero to one. Um, any other questions for attendees? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I have a question. So um, I think the negative Phillips curve relies on the wage channel. Right. You explain it as saying uh, it's the outside option of the workers uh, that becomes worse. That's why um, it, it's like uh, working against the usual uh, Phillips curve that we're getting, for, for example, from Brinson Menzi and what, right. However, I'm thinking then the same channel should also be exist in Brinson Menzi and right 2011. Right. Why is it the wage channel works um, in, in this paper in this way, whereas in other papers works differently. Is it because, is it because there's a complementarity between capital and labor? So capital accumulation is reduced. So therefore the demand for wage is therefore reduced. Is that because of that? Uh, no, it's because in Barron's uh, BMW, wage is paid at the end of uh, 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 at, in a CM, not in right, right after LM. So whether you're employed or unemployed, you don't get wage right away. So in the in the DM, you only use cash from CM to finance your purchase. But the outside option, 
but the outside option story works as saying uh, because you have a higher unemployment rate, so therefore that's why the outside option becomes worse. Is that the uh, the mechanism? I think then it, it doesn't matter when you receive the wage. I thought. I thought. Yeah. Uh, no. So here the outside option. Well, an un unemployed worker has to uh, 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 finance the um, purchase with all cash, but employee worker can use their wage income in the previous LM, right? Labor market income to finance their purchase as well. Right, so- In defense of, of Beckerns and AL, it was irrelevant for us when you got paid. If you got paid in one CM or the, just because across centralized markets, you know, it was, there, there's frictionless deals. So, you could use your wage, even if it has, I mean, it's going to depend on how you set it up, but there was nothing in our paper which hinged on the payment of wages. We could do it differently and it would not have changed anything. Now, in your case is different, I guess. And I think it's reasonable because, I mean, the most important thing is probably that the unemployed have trouble getting credit. So they need to rely more on cash. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I think actually Zach explained that well. I mean, here we do have this kind of asymmetry between the access to credit between the uh, uh, employed and unemployed, also between the firm side and the household side. So that's why actually uh, timing, I mean, we assume this way timing, so it kind of works for our story. So as Zach mentioned, I mean, if we do the timing differently, whereas that, that uh, the timing was did in the uh, BMW paper, so actually it will be a different result. Yeah. I see, I see. Thanks. All right, so we'll move on to the next talk. Um, next, so Ariel will talk to us about blockchain. All right, got you guys in front of me. So let me start just by uh, thanking the organizers, uh, you know, Jonathan and, and you and Randy for including our paper. I mean this quite genuinely. It's been exciting to see such a diverse program and it's really inspiring to, to think about all the issues monetary economics can think about. Uh, second, I also miss all of you. Uh, so it's great to get a chance to see everyone. Um, I also am amazed with Randy's ability to translate sitting in the back of the room, multitasking on his computer and delivering insightful comments and how he's replicated that here on Zoom. So, so thank you. So this is a paper about blockchain. Uh, you know, switching from Phillips curves to blockchain is a, is a leap. Um, it's joint work with one of our great graduate students, Zara Ebrahimi, uh, and my colleague who's on the call, Brian Rutledge. So, it's useful to ask what is blockchain? This is a paper about how and why blockchain works from an economic perspective. So let me start with a basic idea of you know, what I think of as blockchain, and then I'll give you a more technical definition. At its core, it's a bit like moving backwards for monetary economists. Blockchain is a new way to generate a shared memory. Okay, It's a memory shared across a disparate set of individuals who may or may not trust each other. Formally, as David Endelfato likes to tweet sometimes when he wants to rile up Bitcoin enthusiasts, it's a spreadsheet. It's a little more than a spreadsheet. Uh, it's a decentralized distributed ledger. So what does that mean? Let's start at the end. It's a database, but it's a particular form of a database. It's a ledger, meaning it's an ordered list of transactions. You're all used to ledgers, right? They exist in your bank who keeps tracks of your deposits and, and debits. Uh, it, it exists on Wikipedia, say, where you have an ordered list of write transactions, edits of a given web page. It's distributed in the sense that a copy of this ledger exists on many different users' computers, if you will. And you're all used to distributed databases because almost all of you use Dropbox, right? Where you all have your own copy of a shared file that you share with your friends or co-authors. Now, the problem with distributed databases is they can get out of sync. And so we need some way for this distributed ledger to have agreement. And the way we usually resolve that is to have a centralized party like Dropbox in charge of dictating what is the correct version of the ledger we should all be accessing. But a blockchain is decentralized in the sense that there's no individual in charge of dictating what is right. Now, if it works and it generates this new form of shared memory, it should not surprise anyone in this crowd that one application could be enlarging the set of incentive feasible allocations we can attain much the same way money can allow us to do that, okay? This should be no surprise to us that Bitcoin emerged as an application of the shared memory. But for shared memory to work and be useful, everyone accessing this ledger has to agree on what is the correct version of this ledger. We need some notion of consensus. And equally important, 
we need to make sure this ledger can't be changed, right? And, and the computer scientists call this finality of a ledger. We have to make sure what was part of our agreed ledger yesterday doesn't vanish when we get there today. And so what is our paper doing? Our paper is trying to develop a theory of shared memory that represents features of blockchain. And the key idea is to ask, how do we attain shared memory when agents are strategic? So if you, again, if you ask computer scientists, does Bitcoin's protocol work? They will say yes. And what they mean by that is, if I have a bunch of honest agents, and by honest, they mean dogmatic, who just follow some specified protocol, and I have some malicious agents, they have no real preferences, they're just malicious in arbitrary ways, will we attain consensus and finality? And the answer is, as long as we have enough honest agents, then we will. But this isn't how we as economists think, right? We don't envision the world as having just perfectly honest, dogmatic agents. We think of people as strategic and self-interested. And so what we want to do is, does blockchain work? Does this shared memory work when people are actually strategic, when they have well-defined preferences, they're all self-interested? Can we attain consensus and finality? And that's what our paper is trying to do. So if anyone here owns a Bitcoin, I'm sure you totally understand why your $50,000 investment right now is immutable and can't be changed. I'm a bit slower than you and my co-authors. And so we wanted to kind of walk through how do we add transactions to this ledger? And by doing that, I can emphasize the key strategic choices we want to model and think of people choosing. And then I'll give you the key considerations that will arise when working this out. So this is an illustration of a ledger, okay? The nodes here, the blocks, the squares represent blocks of transactions, okay? And I want you over time to envision this set of blocks growing to the right. So blocks are being accumulated in time in that direction. And each block is ordered in the sense that blocks point to some previous parent block. So all of these links point in this other direction. Is that clear? Transactions are sequenced in blocks and ordered. And so that's a ledger. So if you think about this as Bitcoin, we're just adding messages. Please credit someone's account. Please debit my account. And whether we can do that depends on whether along this ledger you have enough credits. So let's update it slowly. Here are two users in the cryptographic kind of style. I'll call them Alice and Bob. And for whatever reason, Alice wants to send, let's say, a Bitcoin to Bob. What does she do? She writes a new message. Alice sends Bob one Bitcoin, and she will digitally sign it with some cryptographic signature. She broadcasts this message out into the world. Namely, she sends it to a bunch of validators who have some memory pool of other possible messages. And those validators, here's one, let's call him Marty for a miner. This validator will pool these messages into a new block that they can possibly add. Okay, so in modern history, the people in charge of recording new information in databases, we usually call accountants. Uh, accountants have a lot of trouble attracting students even at a you know, very good business school like Tepper. So in blockchain, they had the great innovation to call them miners because undergrads find that really attractive. So instead of calling them accountants, we'll call them miners, okay? Um, and what does this miner Marty do? He does a bunch of validation steps. Marty looks at the, the message, say Alice sends Bob a Bitcoin. He makes sure the digital signature is correct that it came from Alice. He makes sure Alice actually has credits on the existing ledger up to one Bitcoin. He'll block that with some other messages. And then there's some process, which depends on the particular blockchain instance you're looking at, where Marty will try to add this to the ledger. And what does add it to the ledger mean? Marty will try to append this at the end of our current blockchain. That's it. I haven't told you why Marty wants to do this or what his motives will be. I'll get to that in a minute. But again, this ledger, that's just a ledger and how we add, but it's distributed, right? Which means other people have the same ledger before Marty added it. And distributed networks have problems of being out of sync. So at the same time Marty was trying to add this block, there was another miner, let's call him Morty, who picked a different set of transactions and may have tried to add the same block. And if he does so, roughly at the same time, we can have conflicting versions of the ledger. This actually happened in Bitcoin two weeks ago. One of the big exchanges said, oh no, there's a conflict, there's problems, people spent money twice, and there was a big hubbub and the price fell, something like $3,000. Conflicting ledgers are a feature of life in distributed networks. So we need a way to resolve these, okay? And once you have the possibility of conflicting ledgers, we start seeing why strategic motives might show up. Do I always wanna follow a rule of, of what I'm supposed to do? Let me come back to that in a moment. So the first question you might ask is, why do these people validate blocks at all? And this has been a feature of study in a lot of the economics research on blockchain so far, which is first, we know at least in Bitcoin, 
When you validate a block, you get to add a new message. This is monetary seniorage in Bitcoin's network. I get a new Bitcoin from, from heaven, from mana from heaven. Okay. Second, when Alice sends her message, she could, if she wants, incorporate a fee that says, whoever validates this block, I will send a Bitcoin to, okay? or a fractional amount of Bitcoin to. That's why miners may be interested. But the question we want to ask is, how do miners choose among conflicting ledgers? How do they choose where to add new blocks to the ledger? So that's going to be our key consideration. Just to go back for a moment. When confronted with a ledger, we want to ask, where do miners want to incorporate new information? Bitcoin has one protocol for that. And a lot of the economic research that has been done on Bitcoin takes that strategy that Bitcoin proposes as exogenous and given. And we want to take a step back and ask, how do we incentivize miners to choose the right location where to add their block? So again, do current protocols align miners' incentives? Do they induce miners to add in the right location? And second, once you agree we can have conflicting ledgers, you can start to see the strategic problems that can arise here. Hi, Ricardo, it's nice to see you. If I send Ricardo a Bitcoin somewhere and Ricardo has sent me a Ferrari, well, let's say I send him three Bitcoins and he's given me a Ferrari in exchange, suddenly do I as a miner have incentives to generate a conflicting ledger that omits that transaction where I sent Ricardo a Bitcoin? Because these can exist, we can't rule out that possibility and so I might want to do that. And so what we want to do is develop a theory of miners' incentives. So it's a new theory of blockchain to try to understand miners' incentives of how they want to update their ledgers. And we want to see if we can generate equilibrium outcomes that generate useful shared memory. Equilibrium That's a question, that Ariel, about that. Please, Ricardo. I, I, thought, I thought they are, maybe what I'm saying is outdated, but they had some rule that six blocks, it's enough until the transaction is firm. I mean, there's this like, norm out there and i thought so, the incentive is clear if you if you spend your resources adding to the one to the losing fork then that's your incentive you want to be on the one that's going to get validated by the rest i will come back to that you're absolutely right that typically if i send ricardo bitcoins he will wait until a certain number of blocks have been added after that transaction to give me the ferrari and at that point if i try to generate a new competing conflicting fork i have to generate a lot of blocks which is costly to do now, the problem with that, and I was going to, you know, I, I can tell you that right now is, of course, the cost of adding new blocks is some exogenous cost. It has nothing to do with your gains, the benefits of unwriting a given transaction. So there's no way for that disincentive to try to create a separate fork to be incentive compatible for all possible transactions, for all possible mining powers, right? The cost is not at all linked to the benefit of trying to do this. So there have to be benefits large enough where you would want to undertake that. And that's the problem with the existing setting. But Ricardo is hinting at something really important, which is the settlement lag between when someone sends a Bitcoin and when they receive real delivery of goods, we will argue in this paper, is a crucial feature of blockchain networks. And I'll show you where that comes up when I construct an equilibrium. We're economists though, and especially in this crowd, I want to jump to the model, okay? So this is a model that's new, that's trying to characterize um, you know, how shared memory works. So let me try to describe these features with our environment. The key ingredients here, we're going to focus on, we're going to have M strategic agents. Think of these as the miners in the real world. Again, I'm going to represent the blockchain ledger as a graph, okay? It's a set of nodes, which we'll think of as blocks, and edges, which link each block to a previous parent block. Again, the key strategic decision of our miners, they'll receive some new transactions and they'll choose where to incorporate those onto the existing graph of the blockchain. Again, I'm gonna interpret this entirely as Bitcoin today. So think of every transaction as a credit or debit of some unit of account. I'm not gonna tell you why it's worth $50,000, why it may be worth zero. I'm just gonna say there are these lists of credits and debits in this graph, okay? In the paper, we talk a bit about how this framework would kind of in a straightforward way generalize to other public blockchains. By public, I mean permissionless blockchains, uh, like Ethereum, where you could store things besides credits and debits, like computer software uh, that give rise to smart contracts, or other protocols like proof of stake. But today, this will look most closely like proof of work, where miners solve some computational problem, and if they find a successful solution, they get to add their block. Okay, These are our ingredients. Again, I'm representing the state of our game. We're developing an extensive forum game to capture this idea. And the state of the game at a given period 
is a graph of existing blocks. Okay, so formally it's a tree. There's some original node and then every block gets added to that origin node. So I want you to picture the state that all agents are confronted with as this existing graph of previously encoded transactions. And I'm intentionally drawing this to have some what we call forks where, where this graph splits off at different points to illustrate the idea that we can have conflicting versions of this ledger. Ariel, can I ask a clarifying question? Of course, is this Randy. A, is this a finite game? It's an infinite horizon game. Okay, that was important, right? Because there could be more equilibrium due to the infinite horizon potentially. That's correct. So I'm gonna denote B as the set of blocks. So G is my graph, my representation of the nodes and edges. I'm gonna to refer to nodes as blocks given our application. Blocks are gonna contain the data that's being encoded. And B of G is a set of blocks that exist in a given graph. Now, if I pick a particular block B, because every node has at most one parent, right? They can have multiple children, but they have at most one parent, I can define a chain that goes back to the origin node, the genesis block as it's called in the industry. And so in particular, if I link that sequence that forms a chain and every chain defines a distinct ledger in this game. Pick any path through the tree that defines a ledger. And so if I'm adding up your credits and debits along this path, your balances on every chain may be different. What is a miner's choice in this game given this graph? A miner's choice is simply an action, pick a block in this graph. And what am I doing? I'm choosing that block to append a new block of data to. So miners are free to go anywhere they want in the existing block. They may not be successful, but they all get to choose some location where they can append new data. And then what we're gonna assume here, how does the graph get updated? If I have M miners and they each choose a given block, for each miner M with probability PM, miners block is added to that location. So the graph tomorrow will look like this graph with whichever location miner M happened to choose with probability PM. This is our, our simple Very representation. Go ahead, David. Um, yeah. So the miners get to choose a block. So the way I'm thinking about this is at any given point in time, a number of people are broadcasting, Alice and Bob are broadcasting the type of transaction they want to undertake. Is it not the case that this broadcast is broadcast to the entire community? Yes. The entire, so it's, it's common knowledge among all the miners. Why would they, it sounds like they get to choose which subset of broadcasts they want to form into a block. Is that, is that what you're saying? So I'll answer on the next slide where I show you what is in, was it, what's encoded in a block, how we're mapping that. Okay. The short answer for today, think of there's one set of messages in every period that miners will encode. Now a concern you might have, and that's common knowledge, and all miners will encode the same block. A concern you might have is if Alice sends Bob a Bitcoin, that may only be valid when attached to particular chains. That may not be valid at any block. And what we're gonna do is take a very kind of background approach to this. We're gonna say, imagine you allowed any transactions that could be added anywhere. Can I construct an equilibrium? And if so, I can do so when I restrict the set of the strategy space of our agents in the same way. Okay. 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 So we're gonna allow them to append them in places that in the way you were thinking, I think may not make any sense. So that even if I restrict them to where I want them to go anyway, it'd still be an equilibrium. So we're gonna to try to take a very general approach to this. The cost of that is these transactions look very kind of abstract. Um, they don't have a lot, we're not modeling the process by which transactions appear, okay? So what is in this block? We have two elements in this block. So in each period, zero, one, two, et cetera, miners will observe a new block of potential transactions they can add. And what's in that block B first is this large vector Y and that vector an element in that vector is YMB. It's a net credit or debit, if it's negative, for minor M that is in this block. And we have this number for every person, right? So likely this is zero for most people, but it could be five credits for Brian and, and minus five credits for Leanne, okay? And we're gonna encode this information. That's equivalent to Leanne sending Brian uh, five Bitcoins, if you will. And second, as I said, we're taking as given miners kind of overall reasons to wanna do this in the first place, Miners are gonna to get to reward themselves for encoding a new block. And that we're gonna denote little y. And we're taking this totally exogenously and that's something we're interested in extending. But the idea here is that if I am minor m 
and my block that I try to add gets added, then I get a reward Y bar and no one else, no other miner gets a reward. So the little Y is the reward, the big Y are the list of credits and debits we're encoding into our blockchain. So we know what's in a block, we know what a graph is, we know miners' actions. What I have to do is define miners' payoffs. And this is not trivial. I'm looking at a graph and let's say, for example, it's mostly empty and miner one has a credit in one block, Y1, and a credit in another block, Y1 prime. What I have to be able to do is define preferences over this graph, given the actions of all the players. And here's how we do this loosely. What we're going to do is say, when miners pick a block, they're telling the network which data they think is valid. And in that sense, you as an individual will get more value out of your balances, if you will, on chains other people say is valid. So in particular, if for whatever reason, all of the miners, let me annotate this, if all of the miners in this period pick this block to extend, that defines a chain. And miner one is gonna say, I value the credits I have in this chain more than I value the credits I have off the chain. This is baking in a notion that we do better when we agree. It does not imply the equilibrium forces us to agree. It just says memory is useful to the extent we agree and we value agreement ex ante. So how do we model this formally? Okay, again, I want you to think my period utility are the coins on the consensus chain where consensus is driven by the actions of the other miners today. So again, I need utility for miner M, given a history, and given all of the other miners' actions, what blocks they choose today, right? This is standard game theory. That's what we have to define. This has nothing to do about which block gets added. This is all defined about, given everyone's actions today, what are my period preferences? And so let me uncover these a bit. The first thing I do is I look at all blocks in the graph and I add up my balances, right? So I'm summing up the big Ys for myself, M, and the little Ys, my rewards. So I value my balance. I get utility from having a large balance on this graph. But again, I don't value every net credit equally. I value credits on the consensus chain. And the way we model consensus is I look at where all the other miners are playing today. And if they are trying to append to a given chain where my block lies, where my credit lies, then I value that by more. I add those miners' weights. And then I'm just normalizing by the other weights, the weights of all the miners. You could think about this as saying, I only value blocks that are in the intersection of the chains developed by all of the miner strategies. That would be a very um, non-convex way of doing this. And all we're trying to do is capture that spirit in a much smoother way. Now I have to come back to Ricardo's point though, which is somewhere on this chain, you might have a negative spend. You might have, I have sent someone Bitcoin, that's a debit. What do you get for having a debit in this network? The answer is in the real world, somehow you get some goods. Or you get some happiness from sending your friend a gift. So how do we model that? That is this last term here, let me highlight it. So for negative transactions, YMBs that are negative, there's one date where you will realize a flow surplus, okay? And lambda, the little lambda, is an indicator function of when goods are delivered. And this can be history dependent. So Ricardo proposed the current rule in Bitcoin, which is you wait for six blocks. Once six blocks are added, then you get your goods. That's when this settles. From then on, you've got this negative balance floating around. That brings you negative utility every period of this game after that. But there's one point where you get compensated for that with some offline flow of real world goods and services. But anticipating there might be a delay, if I send Ricardo a Bitcoin today, I might have to wait a year for Ricardo to deliver the goods. We incorporate an adjustment that accounts for that, which is the amount of goods I have to get have to compensate me for the lag where I suffer disutility from having a debit. And therefore goods are just fairly priced, okay? Incorporating this delay. Lambda here is a function of blocks, credits, and the histories. And we'll tell you how this is pinned down through equilibrium strategies, okay? But for now, just take it as agents take this as given, given some function lambda. And the last thing we do is a normalization of payoffs. We just uh, attribute them by the discount rate. Agents will discount a rate delta. And so if I aggregate lifetime expected utility, it looks like this, it's pretty standard. The risk here is over which blocks get added in each period and what transactions will appear. 
So we're taking these transactions, as I said, as entirely exogenous. They're just random objects that come every period. And so you're taking expectations over those transactions and over the realized outcomes of the blocks. The discounting we have here just ensures that say you have one credit on the Genesis block and you never spend it. The Genesis block lies on chains for everyone. So all of the P's cancel out, the indicators go away and you just get one in every period. You get a credit of one as a flow payoff in every period, which is actually one minus Delta with the discounting. So your lifetime utility of Satoshi Nakamoto with one credit on the Genesis block is one. I added this slide based on Randy's questions yesterday. We should be precise in our notion of equilibrium here. And so what we are assuming and studying- I'm sorry, uh, Ariel, before, ahead, you, David. before you uh, uh, define the equilibrium, the, the game, there's, there's no notion of uh, expending effort, anything that corresponds to, to mining effort. So the assumption is your mining effort is exogenous. With probability P, your block gets added. And my choice of how much effort to expend determines that probability, but we are not studying that endogenous decision. That, that seems kind of important. What we are going to look for are equilibria that occur for any, any dis distribution of mining power. Okay, okay, and just thanks for clarifying. I think that's a great discussion to have over coffee later today of going to the next step of then endogenizing those choices. Should they be ex ante or every period determined? But for today, we want to look for equilibria for any distribution of mining power. Are Our you notion of question about the preferences, I'm not so yeah. clear on. Yeah, we said here, uh, mines are direct preferences for consensus. Is that the same as taking expectations over the possible things we might coordinate on? Or is it different? I, I can't. Uh, so the way I mean that by language is I get more value from nodes where more people agree is the consensus chain. Okay, but no, okay. That does I not suppose... discipline the types of equilibria that can emerge. Okay. Um, so I was thinking you're looking forward, you're taking expectations over what um, histories we're gonna uh, coordinate on and you don't know, you have uncertainty over that and that uncertainty depends on, on people's actions, not only today, but also going forward, right? Absolutely. So that's, that is captured here. Sorry, I'm, I'm missing that. No, so, so remember, I'm showing you just the stage payoffs in the top line. So actions today pin down my stage payoffs. What you care when developing your strategy yeah. is your continuation expected utility. Okay, and we haven't and gotten that to that will yet. will of course depend on agent strategies in the future. Okay, that's the bottom line? Yes. Okay, that's it. You can imagine starting the bottom line for any period T looking forward, right? This is a repeated game. I see. And the decision of which one wins is what is it taken it's, by what? Which one is endogenous, the drawn by nature that with probability PM minor M's block is added. Oh, okay. It depends on how many there are also? No. Yes. And there are mining powers, the P's. Okay. You'll see that in a minute when I do some okay. examples. Okay. So again, we're studying, I have to speed up a bit, perfect public equilibrium. Strategies depend only on the history of the graph, not miners private histories of actions. What, what this imposes is a requirement that for every date T and every public history, uh, the continuation strategies induce a Nash equilibrium. For us, we have no exogenous forcing process for conflict in the ledger, right? There is no sense in which two blocks can get added at the same time. One block gets added per period. But by studying a notion of perfection, we can start with graphs that have conflict and ask, does a given protocol or, or proposed strategy induce uh, uh, consensus. Okay. Um, one of the values of writing this down as a game in this way, of course, is we can apply standard tools from game theory, like the one-shot deviation principle to, to evaluate equilibria. So let me start just, why is the longest chain Bitcoin's proposal? Everyone should append blocks at the end of the ledger, find the longest chain and add blocks there. Why is that not a public perfect equilibrium? And so this is a graph that's intended to illustrate that. Here's a graph now in our language that has just one transaction in each block. Um, think of that as the mining reward, if you will, if you want. What's the longest chain? It's the middle path through this, through this graph, okay? Now imagine the mining weights, or, or sorry, I have to step back a minute. The longest chain is the middle. If you're miner one, you are told mine on the center path. What is your reward for doing so? Imagine in the future you expect all net credits and debits to be zero, you're doing this just for the mining reward. With probability P1, your block is added. You get the reward Y bar. 
And then again, it's the longest chain, you extend the middle of the graph. You do it again with probability P1, you're gonna get another reward. And in discounted value, that's just gonna generate value Y bar for every frame. So what's your total benefit of following the consensus chain? On average, you expect to get two P1 Y bar. But off the consensus chain, you have this credit Y1. Could you do something to capture it? Well, suppose you deviate. If you add a block with probability P1, your block gets added. It's still not the consensus chain, so maybe no one follows you. But if you can add a second block then, because it's among the longest chains, you're allowed under a one-shot deviation to consider that, you could try to add two blocks in a row. What's your benefit if you're successful with probability P1 squared? You coop, you recoup this big, large credit Y1. Why? Because when you do two in a row, the behavior of all the other miners switches. They jump to your chain. That is now the consensus chain. So in other words, if you have a lot of mining power, P1, or the credit that is embedded in this graph but not on the consensus chain is really, really large, you have incentives out of equilibrium to deviate from the proposed protocol, mine the longest chain all the time. Big miners can exploit the future consensus to acquire, to put value off the consensus chain on the consensus chain at a later date. What's the second problem here? So that's a coordination failure. People may want to deviate and not coordinate as we direct them. The second problem is this longest chain may not be public perfect because of what's called a classic double spend. Okay. So what's the idea here? We have a graph. Somewhere in this black graph, miner four has sent Bitcoins to someone. And maybe they've received some goods. And this is what I mentioned earlier. The consensus chain, of course, is the top fork, which is longest. Might miner four want to deviate? And if minor four deviates, of course, perhaps with some small probability, because minor four would have to add four blocks in a row. And if minor four is unsuccessful, he or she is giving up the potential reward she would get from extending the current consensus chain. But if she is successful, the consensus switches and she gets that credit off the balance sheet. She can effectively spend that Bitcoin again. She spent it once, she got a Ferrari. She then mined like crazy this bottom fork. And if it becomes a consensus, she gets her Bitcoins back and her, she still has her Ferrari, okay? Again, it's you take the idea that I can change the behavior of all these other miners under the proposed equilibrium to induce a better consensus chain that I like. Now, again, the folk wisdom here is, well, the mining power you have is small. It's really hard to do this. So the benefit of doing this won't, won't, won't yield the rewards. But as I said here, it's very, very transparent. The, the cost of doing this is just the foregone future blocks you're going to add. And those have nothing to do with your transactions. So if I make Y4 a large enough negative number, right? So you've spent enough, enough money, eventually I will violate that incentive constraint. And therefore longest chain cannot be public perfect, right? The cost of the attack is not linked to the potential benefit. And I mean, therefore it's trivial to cook up incentive compatibility constraint problems. Shen Sheng? Uh, you have four minutes. Okay, thank you. Now, what does this say? A lot of economists have said, this means longest chain is not in equilibrium if transaction values can be particularly large. And they say, therefore, the value of Bitcoin has to be bounded. But as economists, we don't usually write down games and say a proposed strategy is not in equilibrium, therefore the parameters must live in that constraint set, right? The natural question is, if this is violated, what is an equilibrium? And so that's what we do. We build an equilibrium and it has two key features that I'll try to emphasize. The first, which is quite different from Bitcoin's proposal, uh, and I'm happy to talk after when there's time about why this is important, I think, but our strategies feature history dependence. Formally, we're gonna construct a non-Markovian equilibrium, okay? Strategies can differ across two different histories that give rise to the same state or graph in a given period. We're gonna embed that summary statistic of that history dependence as a quote unquote checkpoint. But this is not dictated by any central party. This is just a feature of the equilibrium. I'm going to construct an equilibrium that depends on some summary statistic of the history. And second is this settlement lag. I'm going to condition when goods are delivered to features of the equilibrium strategy to resolve coordination and double spends. The theorem in the paper is there's an equilibrium with these properties that delivers coordination, no coordination problems and no double spending. It is an equilibrium. It's an equilibrium for essentially any distribution of transactions of big Y and for any distribution of mining power P. So we're not subject to the critique that all miners should be small. You can't have a miner with 51% power. That's not problematic in this environment. 
I'm going to explain this because I only have two minutes. Uh, assuming from any given fork, uh, there are no more big transactions. It's just the rewards because that's the easiest case to illustrate the proofs. We're generalizing this in the paper. So first, one feature of our, our coordination problem, our equilibrium, is what we call approval weights. I look at this graph, and instead of mining the longest chain, I'm going to construct weights which reflect kind of the mining power of miners who like each chain. So the top chain, when I go up on the top fork, has miners two and one interested in that chain, so I add their mining weights, P1 and 2. The middle is 2 and 3. I add their weights, P1 and P2 and 3. The bottom has P1. Now, what I'm going to do is direct miners to mine the chain with the highest approval weight, which in this case, if P1 is the biggest, P2 is middle, will be the top fork. So before, if I apply the same logic of the coordination problem, it says if Y3 is big enough, minor 3 should want to deviate. But what happens if minor 3 deviates? If minor 3 deviates, they add a block that only minor 3 cares about. They don't change the approval weight. So they don't change the future behavior of any other miners. Their value is already incorporated there. In other words, no miner on their own under these approval weights can induce a switch in the future behavior of other miners. And that's different from longest chain. Okay, so that can resolve the coordination failure. More subtly is, are these checkpoints. And the idea is we're directing miners to only consider blocks that are ahead of a given checkpoint. So imagine I'm staring at this graph and the checkpoint, remember this is a summary statistic of the history. For whatever reason, miners say, I should only mine blocks, consider blocks ahead of the checkpoint. And it looks like the graph I've displayed to you. Here on that second block after the checkpoint, miner four has this big negative transaction. What we're telling them is that the lambda function, the settlement function, in this case is zero anytime transactions are ahead of the checkpoint. So at every date, the settlement doesn't happen. I send Ricardo the Bitcoin, Ricardo says, Y4 is not behind the checkpoint, I'm not gonna give you the Ferrari. When I don't have the Ferrari, it does me no good to try to steal back that Bitcoin. I've spent it, but I haven't gotten anything. I, it's not a double spend at that point yet. So that doesn't do me any good. But imagine for some reason, the block updates, we add a block and suddenly the checkpoint jumps and now, now the settlement vests and now Ricardo sends me the Ferrari. Now that Ricardo sent me the Ferrari, I want to try to create this other chain and mine it like crazy to make it longest, but no one cares about longest chain anymore. People only mine blocks after the checkpoint. And because people only mine blocks after the checkpoint, nothing I do by creating forks that try to eliminate that settlement can get rid of that spend transaction. As soon as goods settle, you lose the power to write blocks because all miners ignore any old transactions. Let me wrap up with just two slides. So there's some implications and some limitations of what we've constructed as an equilibrium. First, it turns out in the richer model, kind of out of equilibrium, our strategies tolerate a lack of consensus. We allow miners to choose different blocks where they want to mine, and that could potentially be costly. How quickly they will converge back to a full consensus strategy uh, depends on the distribution of transactions that emerge. That's especially costly when I go back to computer scientists and say, well, if I just have malicious people generating forks for random reasons, our proposed strategy will generate a lack of consensus, which from a welfare perspective is costly. The second thing, which I think is a big deal, is this settlement lag is crucial for eliminating double spends. So it's implicit in Bitcoin's strategy. We're trying to make it quite explicit. Okay? You need to have a lag to create that history dependence that says, this transaction occurred far enough in the past the only reason you'd be trying to mine behind it is to eliminate a previous spend transaction. So it's letting us observe kind of malicious behavior and it's letting us ignore malicious behavior. We're not punishing it, we're just ignoring it. So they're not trigger strategies, but it's giving us a way to ignore these. And the last is we think there's an important link that comes out of this between latency in a system and this optimal settlement lag. History dependence in a distributed ledger is, is, is risky, it's risky in the sense of if some of you observe some history of the blockchain that's different from mine, and we're using history dependent strategies, we can get stuck off on our private forks. We may not actually come back to agreement. So you want the history dependent somehow to have a big enough lag to accommodate the technological latency that exists in our network to avoid that problem. And that we think is the fundamental friction in blockchain is you need some latency in settlement to accommodate consensus. 
which to me suggests maybe blockchain is useful for say buying a Tesla uh, where you don't mind the settlement lag, um, which may or may not be hype, but maybe true. Uh, and maybe it's less useful for small value transactions. And so let me conclude there. Thanks everyone. Okay, thank you, Ariel. Uh, our discussant is Dimitri Olaf. Sound and screen check. Can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yep. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to discuss this very interesting paper. Um, I uh, am a big fan of the author's kind of previous work. So when I saw them write a paper on blockchain, I thought that, you know, I, I was excited to read it carefully and I've seen Ariel presented before. Uh, I myself am coming to the Mad Money Conference from the Mad City of Madison, which is, you know, uh, if UW ever doesn't pay Randy his salary, he can pick a choice of any building on this, on this uh, picture. Uh, so let's kind of, so let's talk about the paper. Ariel did a good job summarizing it. And uh, I'll just, I'll be brief, it's gonna be one slide. So blockchain mining focuses on the longest chain rule. That's kind of our chief, um, the chief idea. So if you see uh, the longest chain wins, if you are unsure where to add a block, you should add it to the longest chain. Now this poses an issue for miners or for you know individual miners, interested parties, uh, when they say they want to buy the Ferrari, for example, when they want to buy the Ferrari, they want to double spend, they want to bounce the check, all of these uh, things that I think kind of the uh, literature on, in both computer science and economics kind of understands the incentives problems associated with it. And uh, the paper starts off with kind of this just statement that that's true. It's unavoidable because there will be transactions which you will want to avoid so long as chain rule is inherently unstable. And it's, you know, hard to disagree with and so what is the mining equilibrium beyond the longest chain? Meaning that the longest chain can very much be an on-path behavior, but how is this sustained by the kind of off-path strategies of this dispersed community of miners? And this paper presents an approval weighted checkpoint strategy. So it contains two pieces. One is approval weights, and the second is the checkpoints. So Ariel spent, um, so, in, in essence, miners coordinate on blocks preferred by miners with more uh, with greater hash rates. Uh, this is not something Ariel uh, spoke um, too much about in his presentation, but that's something I'm going to focus on today because, um, but then on top of that kind of, we have these checkpoints which Ariel did cover. Now, kind of in a nutshell, my perspective on the paper is the introduction of these non mark of checkpoints is super interesting. And I think it has a lot of promise. I am, um, I, but I think that the approval weights and the things and the consequences of having approval weights in the strategy has some uh, limitations and I'm just going to talk about them and I hope the authors will find it um, will find it helpful. But overall, I think that this kind of this checkpoint idea and especially endogenizing the checkpoint idea from the perspective of, for example, using Bitcoin as or using any, you know, cryptocurrency as a medium in, of exchange is very natural and it would be nice to have it kind of as an endogenous outcome. So before I start, and I'm not going to show you too many formulas today, I, but I just wanted to highlight this kind of uh, the preference setting because uh, it kind of appears in the paper. And basically what it says is I, want, I benefit more if I have units of account along the branches that are preferred by bigger miners. Uh, the way, I mean, and this is kind of, this is the mad money conference. So I feel like we need to talk a little bit about money, although it could be any other units of account here. But this is kind of a money in the utility function approach, except it goes a bit beyond that. And this is where, you know, this is where the paper is breaking new ground because it's explicitly tying the value of money to consensus and taking kind of a particular functional form on what that consensus, what that consensus should mean from kind of quantifying these incentives. And my only comment here is that it looks like a complicated object it would be nicer to uh, motivate it a little bit better and motivate the specific functional form a little bit better because right now it kind of appears and I have a sense of where the authors are going with it, but um, it would be nice to just understand the cost and benefits from choosing this particular specification. Now, 
I have spent all the time, while Ariel was presenting, I modified my slides to include our Marty and Morty here. It was furious typing for 30 minutes. So two miners, Marty and Morty, with mining weights P1 and P2, take them anywhere between zero and one. Let's just, you can assume that they add up to one, it doesn't really matter, just suppose that they're positive. I'm going to illustrate to you what this approval weighting uh, equilibrium looks like and uh, uh, kind of everything that I'm going to say right now applies if you introduce checkpoints as well. So this is like kind of without loss from at least as far as I can tell. So basically this is the idea of uh, um, longest chain rule. We see the last block, kind of think about this as the genesis block. We add a block to it and then we continue adding blocks just like that. Now you can tell like from these descriptions, I do not have a background in graph theory. So my approach to understanding uh, this paper was literally just to play with examples and understand kind of, and just learn from that. And so I'm going to present effectively two examples right now. And so we have these blocks and you know, things are good for the Bitcoin world. And then we have a fork. And this fork could occur due to latency. It could be because some miner made a mistake. These things, these things happen. It could be because of software updates and, you know, and it, it is important. And this is kind of what the um, authors highlight. It is important to understand what happens if there happens to be a fork. So where do we add the next block? So the longest chain will, will would prescribe that we will basically ignore this fork and just continue adding blocks along the longest chain. But you know, be, because there are transfers and payoffs and Bitcoin is worth a lot of money, it's not so clear. So here's how the approval weighting works. We look at the common part of the chain and we throw it out. It doesn't matter because basically that's the chain where all where Marty and Morty agree on. So it doesn't kind of change, it, it doesn't affect their net incentives to pick one, for, uh, one uh, branch over the other. However, when, when now, so now we're figuring out like where do they where do they want to add these um, where do we, they want to add um, a block, and I'm not going to actually talk about the incentives to add a block. I'm going to talk about what the approval weighting prescribes them to do. Basically, if I take the equilibrium constructed in the paper, I'm just going to go through what it uh, kind of how it works mechanically. And so we have so in the longest chain in the red chain we have Marty getting point one. In the first block, Morty getting 0.1 in the second block. And in the fork, only Morty gets something. Now, here's how the approval weighting works. In the longest chain, both miners get a positive transfer. So that means they should be both interested in continuing that, uh, that chain further. So that basically means that their, the approval weight of that chain is the sum of their mining power. So that's going to be like 1 if P1 and P2 add up to 1. However, along the top chain, only Morty gets a positive transfer. So that's an approval weight of only P2 less than one. And so that means that the longest chain here is going to win. Now, one thing I kind of want to mention, and this, uh, I, this might kind of um, relate to, what, uh, to my subsequent comments, but the mechanism itself doesn't depend on the magnitude of, these, of, of the transfers that these chains. We can see here that Morty really prefers kind of to, to fork there. But the approval weighting strategy just looks at kind of the sign of the transfers, not so much their magnitudes. But this is kind of how the approval weighting works. And I think kind of first order kind of looks reasonable. So now let's do, oh, and of course we were doing with trees, our bread don't have to have a chainsaw. So we kind of truncate the, we truncate the fork. So now let's tweak the payoffs a little bit. Suppose that in addition to Morty, Marty now also gets something after a fork. So now we have basically the longest chain where both miners get a positive transfer. And then we have the short chain where also both miners get a positive transfer. And when we look at this approval weighting operator, it basically tells us that both branches have the same approval weight, uh, which means it's, you, you actually can't rank branches according to the strategy. And what that means is you, it doesn't actually tell you where to add a block. So this operator that we use to kind of prune the tree until we get this consensus branch, it doesn't work in this example. And this just, you know, an example highlighting kind of where we want to be careful with the fact that whether this kind of pruning operator is indeed a contraction. So it's silent where we should add blocks. I don't think kind of looking, uh, looking at kind of the breakpoint extension of the paper, I don't think that's breakpoints are going to fix that. 
Uh, but it may be simple to fix this gap and I kind of potentially beneficial to the authors. Um, that's why I'm kind of pointing it is that maybe it should, it's better to weight branches by the values of transfers, not just indicators of whether they're positive, uh, whether they're positive or negative. So this is kind of like a gap in the strategy space that kind of once if, you, if you're able to kind of fill it correctly, then uh, you can kind of, you can maintain the off-path characterization similar to what the paper proposes right now. So this was my example one, example number two. Uh, suppose only Marty gets something in the longest chain while only Morty gets something in the fork. So what I did here is basically, if we continue along the longest chain, Marty gets point 0.1 and point 0.1 in both instances while Morty get, gets one only in the fork. So, you know, more examples, but the idea is that if you look at approval weights, because Marty is the only one to benefit from the longest chain, then the approval weight is P1. The fork, only Morty gets a positive transfer, so the approval weight is P2. So how do we decide which, uh, which of the branches to follow? Well, we follow the one with the bigger hash rate. So it's not about the chain length, it's about who has more computing power? And if Marty has computing power, we follow longest chain. If Marty has computing, uh, more computing power, we branch off. And this is where I was thinking, and this made me think that the strategy requires you to understand the distribution of wealth or this Bitcoin wealth in conjunction with hash rate power. And this is something I've asked uh, Ariel over email about, and I'm going to kind of um, elab uh, elaborate on, um, on his response, but it was a helpful clarification. But basically the approval weighting strategy require, requires that it be public how much each miner holds along which chain in order to understand what hash rate is linked to a particular branch. Now, in if you treat miners as individuals, I do not think that this is possible. And the reason is that a miner can have multiple wallets. And if a miner just mines from one wallet, but then spends from the other wallet, just transferring uh, tokens from one wallet to the other, basically, yes, you can do it on the level of a wallet, but it's harder to aggregate wallets to a level of a miner. It has happened in the past, but it's hard to do this kind of on an ongoing basis, especially in a public decentralized uh, view. So I'm not, so, so I was a bit confused about this. And then I, I asked Ariel his uh, kind of, because you know, it's, a, it, it's kind of, a, it sits on the surface, this question. Um, so I'm sure the authors have thought about this. And I, I really um, liked Ariel's response because, well, a miner is actually a mining pool in practice. So basically miners are not fully decentralized. They're actually part of these larger collectives. I don't know if the libertarian Satoshi would approve, but, uh, Kind of that's the organizational structure that we have. So, and this is kind of, this is the mechanics. You observe the mining pool's wallet because the mining pool kind of the wallet, that wallet is constant and you can estimate the hash rate of each pool. And so that's how kind of on a level of a mining pool you can have this mapping between hash rates and how much the mining pool has in a particular branch. So then I followed kind of this, uh, so, so I just, you know, it's a uh, simple um, website where for Bitcoin, uh, where they publicize uh, hash rate distributions across different uh, mining pools and different colors here represent basically the relative, the percentage hash rate power of different mining pools. And we see that A, these PIs that we're talking about are not constant over time. Now they may be public, so that's fine, but they're not constant. And two, over a third of hash rate power is attributed to an unknown pool. And this makes made me think that, okay, well, we know, you know, the mining power behind, you know, two thirds maybe of hash rate, but this massive pool of unknown miners with unknown wallets, it's gonna be harder to construct this approval weighting strategy for that third of hash rate this, um, distribution. Now it was interesting that you know maybe if the paper uh, originated in April, this number of unknown miners was very small, so it's like it was a reasonable assumption. But then it kind of grew really quickly over the last year, and so again, like we're looking at a lot of miners, which while it's it's hard to track, so I'm not sure how to compute the um, approval weighting um, for those miners. Now, kind of I'm. 
I think I'm uh, doing fairly well on time. So in general, my takeaway is that these are novel and cool ideas to think about approval weights, which align with kind of hash rate mining pools. It, it makes intuitive sense that to search for consensus, you want to coordinate on bigger hash rate power. Uh, I also think that this non-mark of breakpoint strategy, which Ariel spoke about and I didn't have time to today, is really novel and I think it's very promising. Uh, the paper has some uh, gaps to fill, such as preferences. Um, kind of, it would be nice to have like a more expansive uh, treatment of strategies for just basically just fill in some of the gaps for um, uh, for some graphs that um, without hopefully changing the ge the general structure, uh, but also motivate a bit better these information requirements necessary for approval weights. In other words, I think that the approval weights and checkpoints between the two, I would prefer to get to look at checkpoints because checkpoints are simple and they're kind of, they're very intuitive, but approval weights introduce some of the things that are a little bit harder just to envision um, working with. But I think it's a great paper with a lot of upside and I really look forward to kind of, you know, Ariel's comments and I hope some of this was useful. Thank you. Okay, Ariel, do you want to? Sure, I'm going to be super brief because that was just a fantastic discussion. So thank you, Dimitri. And especially, I'm sure no one else in this has really kind of read through the paper. It's a bit of a mess. Uh, we we're hoping to do a lot and then the pandemic hit. And so to get all of that out of the paper, I really appreciate it. I just want to make two comments. So one Sorry, of the things- Ariel, I, would, I just want to point out that it's rare that I'm, I'm conflicted as to what to do was his slides are way nicer than yours. <laughs> so so I, don't, I don't know what that says, but you, okay. you go from there. But- so the, the two points I just want to raise is in, in the example Dimitri gave is something we have struggled with a lot. And in the bite in what I did in my slides, which is assume there are no transactions to follow everything else resolves exactly what Dimitri pointed out, but that's not a very satisfying assumption on the data generating process for the transactions. So when I say we can relax that, what I mean is when we allow for the kinds of examples Dimitri allowed, what we know now, which isn't in the paper, so Dimitri couldn't know, is we just let people, and this is what I meant by there's a lack of consensus, we let miners mine where they want. And that incorporates this idea that if Marty prefers that top fork, we let him go there. And so that allows for a temporary lack of consensus, which then gets resolved eventually. But you need some way to know it gets resolved eventually. So I think we're taking care of that. And the second point, you know, I would have loved to be further along in this project to be able to have solved the case with unobservable mining power. I agree, it's kind of, there's a sense in which mining is observable. We see these pools power. There's a sense it's not because we don't really know who's getting the returns. But you have to start with kind of, I mean, this model is already a mess to write down. And so, you know, it's kind of the next step. I think our framework is valuable for asking these questions. And I'd love to do a version of this paper where mining power is unobservable. We're just not there yet. And that's all I'll say. But again, it was a fantastic discussion. I hope you share your slides. Thanks a lot, Dimitri. Thank you. I appreciate that you were able to kind of fill the strat strat strategy gap, then I, I think that's kind of is a nice characterization. Thank you. So I have a question, Ariel. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little slow this morning, so I apologize for that. Uh, I found the slides pretty dense, but the, the basic idea of your exercise, you correct me if I'm wrong, the, the idea is I guess you look, we, we look out in the world there, we, we kind of see this activity, these miners, this blockchain, these, it, it seems to work. And, uh, you know, somehow consensus on this distributed ledger is, is achieved. You know, there's minor hiccups here, there, there are these forks, but by and large, it seems to work. And, well, the, the answer that, uh, you know, computer scientists give us is, uh, you know, it's, it's, as long as we have enough honest miners or honest actors, um, that that's going to be make the system sufficiently robust to ensure that you don't get these problematic double spend problems. And, and you're saying, well, I don't know. I don't know if that's kind of the interpretation I'd want to, uh, to give for this phenomenon. Here, I'm going to, I'm going to introduce, uh, I'm going to try to write down an extensive form of the type of the game I think is being played. I'm not going to mine, I'm not going to model the mining uh, explicitly, but I'm going to I'm going to model like what are what is the incentive incentive actually to come to reach a consensus in a strategic sense in a, in a in the context of a model where these miners actually might profit from miss uh, you know double spending in a sense the information 
and then you construct this is your exercise then to demonstrate you to demonstrate that there is an equilibrium the way you construct it that can actually interpret the activity we see but it's actually the the uh, it's actually not based on the computer sciences naive notion of the existence of a sufficiently large number of honest actors it's it's actually you're showing that what we see in reality is in fact a proper non-cooperative equilibrium uh, and if that's the case, is the claim that it is the equilibrium or are there other equilibria as well? And you just focused on that. Is that, am I capturing the broad idea of what you're doing? So I think you that, are capturing that's, a good, broad idea. that's a good interpretation of the, you see in Bitcoin, this informal, I don't deliver the goods until six blocks have passed. That not is, that's not in the original sort of Bitcoin, but that's essentially sort of in, um, a checkpoint. So your interpretation that says, you know, the way that the way Bitcoin is described is not necessarily the economic equilibrium, I think is a fair way to think about it. And then I think once you write down the economic equilibria, then it opens all these other interesting questions about, you know, how do pe people pick mining power? And what if mining power is less than perfectly observable? What? I, I just want to follow that. I think, you know, I think broadly, I agree with what you're saying, David. I make two points. So one, um, how secure is the consensus protocol for Bitcoin? You know, it's a bit like the walls of a safe. It might be secure for the transaction value we see now. We'd like to know, is it secure for any transaction value? And, and I think there's some simple economics that shows up in some of Bruno Bier's work, some of Eric Budish's work that should give you reason to be suspicious that it's safe for any value we store in it. And so that suggests like at current prices, it seems to work, would it work for any prices? An alternative in interpretation is maybe it works pretty well because if we start deviating massively from the current protocol, actually people would adopt the kinds of strategies we see, right? Along the equilibrium path we model, it looks just like Bitcoin. We only differ in the strategy space out of equilibria. And so maybe, you know, people have forecasted some of these and worked out some of the related strategies to do this. And the last point I'll make is we make no claims about uniqueness. Uh, we, I mean, that's I, it's interesting well. and important. I, <laughs> it, it's not through lack of trying. It's a constructing an equilibrium we found really challenging. Um, and it's just the paper is in progress still. I'd love to say something about uniqueness. I just don't I mean, have it. I, I have to so, uh, make a point about this. I, I think this is kind of a critical uh, question. You say it's something I pose out there all the time for the people. I mean, it seems like it's working. You know, the protocol is working. I mean, but we, <laughs> you know, but the, the, the idea of uh, delegating the responsibility for bookkeeping to a bunch of anonymous actors playing a non-cooperative game and then kind of relying on, you know, we're trusting <laughs> that the equilibrium of this non-cooperative game is going to deliver kind of the, this, this outcome that has good properties. I mean, it's a really quite a, an astonishing idea. So, uh, so, <laughs> so, so, um, so Randy has a, one of Randy's students um, has a paper on, on, on Bitcoin and, and he has um, an, an interesting notion of refinement. We, we would have to scrutinize the, the notion across different equilibrium concepts, but, but the rough idea of, of Randy's student is that um, Bitcoin has the property that you can observe the effort. So, so I know that some, you know, that helps discipline off equilibrium beliefs because I know that if somebody put effort, I know that there's at least somebody that marginally values the, the you know, the coin something. So that I understand helps you kill at least the, you know, non-monetary equilibrium. Yeah, so I think cool. it's something I, I that is very interesting. I with some anonymous student. He's probably in the audience, Kohei. Saki's referring to your work, but not your name. Well, I forgot. Um, he's in the oh, hey, oh, hey, Iwasaki is his name. So, so let me just say that first. Like, I would love to read Koei's paper, so I hope he'll send it to me. Uh, and second, there's a question about what is the equilibrium real value of the units of account on this ledger? From what are the equilibrium strategies that are making sure the ledger is immutable? And, and those are in some ways perhaps related, but as we've written it, we've kind of, we're silent on that earlier one. So I'm right. not making claims that you can always transact these units of account for 
I'm assuming you can transact them at their fair market price. That if I give up a Bitcoin, I get a Bitcoin's worth of goods, whatever that happens to be, right? Well, and that's not going to be pinned down by fundamentals, is it? That's right. It's not pinned down by anything in our model. Um, our model is silent on that aspect of No, that. I mean, in any model, the value sure. of a fiat yes. object is not going to be pinned down by fundamentals. Yes. Yeah, I have a uh, related issue. Maybe it's, maybe it's not related. So to me, there's two. So delay is a big deal here. There's two issues. One is you give Ricardo the, the payment. He may not give you the car. But it works both ways. If he gives you the car first, you may not give him the payment. Is it sort of taken for granted that Bitcoin might have a problem with one of those um, situations, but not the other? So, so in our model, yes, we assume delivery of the goods is committed. Yeah, well, that's kind of funny because it's not in reality. You, <laughs> I, you may see a Ferrari show up in your driveway, but it could be you know, a complete lemon. I, I don't disagree with you, Randy. I, you I also to take an example right, about the yeah, delay in delivering the good may not be a big deal. But I, I think this it might be for something else. I mean, the leading example is you go to the emergency room, you, you say, I think I'm having a heart attack. I need to see a doctor. And they say, let's wait for the check to clear, or in this case, Bitcoin. No, Randy, I think you're asking <laughs> deep questions about what should Bitcoin be useful for? And, and the only point I'm making is we can sustain, right? There are no limitations on the real value of these coins, right? I can make the credits arbitrary and the mining distribution arbitrary, which seems like an improvement over the current economic critiques that- Yeah, I know I'm going to use that. I just think that in reality, it's important to understand this. this uh, delay well, I agree. issue going in both directions. And the only thing I want to say is, so I interpret this as a model of buying Teslas with Bitcoin, where we have other enforcement constraints on the delivery of Teslas than buying Bitcoin through anonymous peer-to-peer -peer markets, buying goods through anonymous peer-to-peer -peer markets. I mean, eBay figured out a way to resolve that in the traditional way. You have some centralized party who will ensure the delivery. Um, but again, that's why I think it leads to interesting questions about what kinds of transactions would we expect Bitcoin in the long run to be useful for? Um, Actually, there's, a, there's kind of a, an interesting um, line of questioning in that regard. Because, you know, one of the big, uh, the, the, philosophical idea behind Bitcoin is that you know, the so-called anonymity it, it provides, right? You don't, you don't need to, to identify yourself to, to open an account. Uh, there's no KYC kind of uh, restrictions. You can spend it on anything. But, but think about actually that application of buying a Tesla. I mean, how would that actually work? I mean, uh, you, you know, you'd, you'd have to identify yourself somehow. I mean, uh, Certainly, Elon Musk is, is, uh, is, is going to have to know uh, and register where these funds are coming, or what, or what would you do? I mean, how would you, suppose I have $100,000 worth of Bitcoin, and I need to liquidate it to convert it to US dollars to buy the Tesla, or what? Actually, perhaps Elon might uh, uh, accept the Bitcoin directly into uh, the account. But then, I mean, that, that, that Bitcoin account is, is, uh, is going to be registered with... Uh, Tesla, and this guy who receives the the uh, Tesla, I mean, the authorities are, are going to be able to see the, the the transaction on the blockchain because it's public. They'll be able to identify the owner of uh, of that blockchain. I, I just find those those issues kind of interesting. I don't think you want to rely on Bitcoin for your anonymity. Yeah, you will end up in jail. Not that yeah, buying Tesla is going to get you in jail, but yes. Yeah. So I, I guess I, th I think pe people are worried about sort of the bigger problem of this ledger being so public is, you know, it wouldn't be that hard to identify the salary that I get from CMU. And then, you know, my Bitcoin wallet, and then you see my uh, Bitcoin being transferred to the local brewery because, you know, every Saturday I need my beer. I, you, This is a level of, of like, it's a long way from an anonymous cashless society. That's, you know, I attended a, a conference uh, five or six years ago on this, and they had uh, members of, uh, from the FBI and the, uh, the IRS were, were giving presentations. And I remember uh, the F these FBI guys and the IRS guys were coming up and going, this, this Bitcoin thing, this is, and this is like five, six years ago. They're going, this is, an, uh, this is a forensic accountant's wet dream. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's all yeah. out there. And, yeah. and you know all that happens. Uh, you know these criminals have to make a little mistake, 
and then they can kind of reverse engineer everything they can but, figure out. I mean, uh, and, who this person is. I mean, they're going. This is this Bitcoin thing is great. <laughs> there's a there's an interesting um, little economic -y thing that one could model, which are these mixers. And so the idea is basically that Ariel runs a mixer, and I send Ariel a Bitcoin, and then he sends a Bitcoin back to some other wallet, and they're <clears throat> they're not connected. But I have to trust Ariel to do this. And so some of these mixers, basically, you send the you send your money into the mixer and it just never comes back and some aren't and some sort of try and build up the reputation of being useful and the one of our co-authors lost um at the time 50 cents worth of bitcoin but he is forever remembered that it's now worth i don't know seventy eight thousand dollars and he's you know in 2013 he lost it he's grumpy about it so can i ask a question uh going back to the so dimitri uh, pointed out the not knowing you know the, the the owners of the P, so it's hard to you know to to weigh them properly. But I mean, even if you did, I mean, these guys could, I mean, they could just uh, manipulate, right, the distribution of P. How do you know who they really are? You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't understand well, how I, I these names the, that you see there. I mean, what the, the tricky the tricky part is, even if I know that your wallet um, is mining and it has a mining power that's you know we've empirically verified is you might have an interest in a transaction that I just can't see, right? You know, uh, Ariel is moving some money between Brian and for whatever reason you are interested in undoing that transaction and it might be a side payment, right? And that that I think is is hard to, like it, it is hard to um, uh, basically, why don't we bribe miners? Right. Even within the, the equilibrium, if I just kind of send some money to a wallet that Ariel can control, uh, he can mine in a way that might be out of equilibria. And yeah, that's the sense fine. in which in our paper, these transactions are exogenous and that if those transactions are endogenous, it's a mess. So it's, it's, not, it's not just sort of seeing it. It's the fact that, you know, I, I, I don't even have to bribe you with Bitcoin, right? I could just have a backup a truck and slide you some old traditional $100 bills and suddenly this changes the way um, you know, where, where you're aiming your next block. Okay, so we will have a short break, but if you want to continue discussion, it's fine. Uh, we'll resume uh, at, I think, one o'clock Eastern time. So since we don't, since we don't have coffee, get an anecdote. Okay, our okay. next talk is by Steve Williamson. He will talk, us, talk to us about CBDC. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here's the main main ideas here. So, uh, so you got a bunch of central bankers who are thinking about uh, issuing issuing digital currency in some form, and uh, you know, so some of the arguments about why they do that have to do with uh, it being potentially useful in online retail payments, where say physical you can't use physical currency, and and then in, in, uh, maybe in wholesale payments too. Uh, but you know some of the, some of the things that make make uh, CBDC attractive it could also potentially make it a, a convenient safe harbor in times of financial stress. Now that can kind of cut both ways maybe. Uh, but uh, something some people worry about, some more than others, I guess, you know, is that, uh, that if, if uh, central banks were to, were to introduce this stuff that it could, it could uh, engender more financial instability by, by encouraging this, this flight to safety. So what I'm going to do here is is write down a model to try to try to try to sort that out. Okay, so so here's a I'm going to call this a conventional narrative, but I don't know maybe maybe this is just my narrative. I'm not I'm not sure. Uh, but but here's here's a here's a, a story about about uh, retail banking panics. So think of this as you know retail banking panics in the 19th century or or uh or or in the in the in the great depression or in the in the u.s or or uh maybe in some parts of the world now but you know certainly this you know i guess retail banking panics weren't particularly uh 
important in the, say, in the financial crisis in the rich part of the world, at least. So, uh, so here's here's the story. So, so the, so so the, some of these panics. So they like like say the 1907 panic in the in the U.S. So it, it kind of starts with some financial institutions, you know, entering a state of potential insolvency, and everybody gets worried about it. So so they know about this potential insolvency of the large large financial institutions. They start worrying about their own. So you got these small retail depositors who aren't so well informed, and they they uh, they start worrying about their own, you know, their own their own bank becoming potentially insolvent. So if the if they if they perceive the problem is is large enough, you know, you could get these large scale withdrawals of of currency, physical currency from from banks. Uh, but you know, in that context, and I think this is something that that like uh, that the Bank of England learned first. You know, so so in the in the context of a financial panic, the central bank maybe has better information on uh, on winners and losers on who you know which which banks are uh, are the are the are the uh, insolvent ones and which ones are just suffering from an illiquidity problem due to the you know the, these uninformed depositors, you know, running for, running for cover. Uh, but the problem here is, you know, potential, you know, there's potential disruption in, in, uh, in retail payments. Uh, uh, so even if, so, so you got the central bank intervening potentially, you know, there's crisis intervention. And uh, so what they're doing is, so they, they lend to the winners, they don't lend to the losers. Uh, but the, what they're doing for the for the banks that are just illiquid is they're they're replacing this outflow of funding with 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 central bank lending, which from the central bank's point of view is is uh, you know is 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 judged as being uh, judged as being safe. So they they kind of you know they 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 prevent the you know the illiquidity problem from 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 uh, from generating. Failures, but there, but there's still this disruption in retail payments, uh, which comes from the, the fact that the you know if if you've got uh, banks with with uh, with uh, with these deposit liabilities, the uh, uh, for some people that the uh, or for your people, given people trying to make particular kinds of transactions, the currency is not so useful. That's where the disruption in payments comes from. Everybody's withdrawing currency, but the currency is not so useful because you find these, these bank deposits useful for making some kinds of transactions. So, uh, so question is, if you, so if you substitute digital currency for physical currency, what, what, what happens then? So maybe, you know, because this potentially this digital currency is more useful, uh, there's less disruption in a panic, but it could encourage the panic to happen, so so that's that's the idea that, that, that you know this 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 uh, this idea kind of kind of cutting both ways, and you'll kind of see how that that shows up in the in the model. Okay, so here's the model. I didn't show you any of the literature, so I thought I thought Waller was still going to be around. So Waller's all Waller would always complain about the the uh, literature slide. So I thought, oh, I'll keep Waller happy, and I won't put the literature slide in. There's a bunch of literature in here, all right, that, that's related, but we won't talk about it. It's all in the paper. Okay, so uh, here's the model. So this is, you know, Lagos Wright type of model. Uh, uh, two sub periods, centralized market comes, comes first. And then there are three kinds of people in this world. So there's buyers, there's sellers, and then there's banks. So there's Unit mass of buyers, unit mass of sellers, but the banks, there's, you know, there's potentially an infinite mass of, of, of banks, and uh, but but some of them are going to be inactive. So there's going to be part of what's going to be important in here is going to be the entry of entry of banks. There's going to be an entry cost, and uh, so so uh, any. It, any period, there's going to be uh, going to be some of these banks that are active, and a whole mess of them that, that, that are not. Okay, so the the uh, but the buyers they they supply labor, 
Labor supply is always H, uh, consumption is always X. Uh, the buyers supply labor in the, in the centralized market, they consume in the decentralized market. The sellers do the reverse. Uh, and, and the banks, can, they can consume and, and, uh, and produce in the, only in the centralized market. So you know, their activity is confined to, to, uh, to centralized markets. Okay, all the production is one for one uh, conversion of labor supply into perishable consumption goods wherever. Uh, centralized market, everyone's together in one place. Uh, and then there's random bilateral meet meetings between the buyers and the sellers and the, and the centralized market. I'm telling you kind of standard stuff. Um, uh, the, Histories of the buyers are are, uh, are private information, so so they have you can't see their history. So their you know their their uh, personal IOUs are useless in the decentralized market for trading. But an active bank, uh, its history is is uh, part of the public record. So and then and that's going to be the interpretation of what this entry cost is. The entry cost is is acquiring a technology that 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 makes you a monitored agent in the context, you know, in the sense of uh, like a kind of, like a cattle canty Wallace kind of, kind of role for banking. That's part of what's going on here. Then there are consolidated government budget constraints. Basically what's going on here is uh, just the, the uh, government has access to lump sum transfers. Uh, you got three consolidated government liabilities, potentially there's, Currency, that's C, uh, digital currency, M, government bonds, one period bonds, nominal, outstanding. Uh, you won't ever have, you know, the, the things I look at, you won't ever have the, uh, the uh, physical currency, the C and the digital currency, M, that's, you know, they're liabilities of the central bank. You don't ever see those coexisting. Just, you know, that's just what I look at here. Uh, so there, there'll be kind of one, like one regime where you've got, you've got uh, physical currency, uh, the, other, the other regime where you've got, you've got digital currency, and then we're gonna, you know, gonna compare the difference. There's this fiscal policy rule here that kind of limits, potentially limits the uh, real value of the, of the, Consult, total consolidated government liabilities, but that never comes into play here. I thought I was going to use this, but I never, I never actually did in the in the model. So that's 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 not that's not going to be important. Uh, okay, this thing down here. Okay, okay. So this is this is a key part. Okay, so here's here's how banking works. So we're going to have uh, uh, have this cost gamma. Which is a one-time cost to, to one-time entry cost for a bank, and again, it's, it's the interpretation is you're you're acquiring a technology that makes your makes your history known. Then what's what's going to happen is that there's potentially the, your your uh, your so what as a result of that so as a result of the entry cost there's going to be a franchise value for the bank. We'll show her you know where that shows up in the in the uh, in the banker's problem later on, but uh, but then there's there's always going to be a chance that something happens that makes your makes your franchise value go to go to zero in a self in a self fulfilling fashion. So so there's there's going to be this 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 sunspot variable, or at least that's one interpretation of what's going on. That there's a sunspot variable, and you say either you know the, you're uh, which is publicly observable. So you're going to see either G or B. B is going to be the the uh, like a, what we're, we'll think of as a as an aggregate bank insolvency state. Uh, okay, so the probability that that B happens is it's I it, there's this sigma is an IID random variable. The probability you get a B is is uh, is delta. Uh, 
then conditional on, 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 on this aggregate insolvency event, we know that fraction alpha of these banks are gonna become inactive. Their, 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 their franchise value is gonna to go to zero because everybody anticipates they're gonna receive no, no deposits in the, in the future. Uh, therefore, that bank is gonna to wanna to, is gonna to wanna to default today. Uh, Steve, can I interject just a question? Yeah. Um, so I presume you're you're gonna ultimately want to apply this this to kind of what we see in the real world. One one important feature of the real world is of course deposit insurance. Oh are yeah, you, yeah. Are you gonna come yeah. back to that later? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna have that. Okay. Eventually. So, so the the yeah the the uh, eventually we're gonna yeah, we're gonna we're gonna think about different <laughs> different cases and and then and then deposit insurance is gonna be an important part of the story. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna have. So the idea is that <laughs> there's gonna be this aggregate insolvency event. We know that fraction alpha of these banks are gonna fail in a kind of self-fulfilling fashion. There are many equilibria here, right? So there are many. Essentially, many, many sunspot equilibria. Uh, you know, as usual, it's it, it, we're, we're, the setup here for a bank is going to be much like you know a typical kind of kind of a lim limited commitment, uh, uh, unsecured credit environment where uh, where uh, you know the the uh, where uh, you 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 repay your debts basically. In a, in a fashion that's supported by beliefs about the future. And that's, that's you know, what, what the bank's thinking about here. Okay. Uh, the timing's gonna be important. Like when, when you, yeah, like when people know about this, about this uh, sunspot variable and, 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 uh, and what they know about it. Okay, so. Todd Keister suggested this was was uh, the the other interpretation of this of this is that this is purely technological that <laughs> you just you acquired a technology so that was the you know the gamma you bear this cost you acquire a technology that makes your history observable and then that that technology is going to fail <laughs> at some at some point but in this particular fashion where you know it's like uh, everybody everybody's technology is going to fail at once sort of, you know, like with some probability. Uh, so, you know, like take your pick. So it's, it's the one, you know, the sunspot interpretation have, has this issue to do with, uh, with you know, multiple equilibria, the, the, you know, technological thing that all works, but, you know, the, the question is what's the interpretation of that? Or how do you map that into what we see in the world? Okay, uh, timing is important. So centralized market, what happens first is all, all the debts get settled from the previous period. The only debt is gonna be the debt of the banks, their, 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 depo you know, the, uh, their deposit liabilities that they make good on, or maybe not in the, in, at the beginning of the centralized market. Then all the production and consumption happens and, and bank contracts get, get written. Then at the end of the period, and people are going to see, they're going to see that sunspot variable for that, like for the next period, this for the subsequent period. Uh, they'll they'll see it in advance. Uh, but at this point, the uh, I kind of I said here, a central bank knows which banks will fail. I think that never. Okay, the way I've got this working now, I think I don't need that. Pretty sure, okay. But in any case, what what happens? What happens at, at the by the end, end of the centralized market is when you're when you're gonna when the withdrawals from banks are gonna happen. So the, there's gonna be this kind of dang big role for for a, for a bank here, and so then there's gonna be you're gonna have some of these depositors will, will have a reason to withdraw at the uh, end of the centralized market. But any, anybody could potentially withdraw. That's gonna be the, the Panic ideas that is is uh, sort of widespread withdrawals at the end of the centralized market here, but it, it's going to going to be triggered by observing this the outcome of this sunspot variable. Uh, okay.
Okay. And then in the once we get to the decentralized market following that, now the seller the sellers have a little more information. So now they it's not 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 only have they seen this the uh, say the the you know uh, sigma t equal b, but they they know which banks are insolvent. So so sellers uh, sellers will not accept some claims. They won't accept the claims on banks that are that are actually insolvent and won't pay off on their deposit claims. Okay, yeah. decentralized market transactions. So there's gonna be a prob probability row that uh, a seller that the buyer meets in the, in the decentralized market when they're matched with uh, will accept only physical currency or CBDC. And uh, there's a probability of one minus row that they set, accept only a claim in a bank or CBDC. So assumption here is kind of how it, something about how the CBDC is designed. So one, one notion might be that uh, it's like probability row that you want, you want to, you want your transaction to be private. So we're supposing here that you can, the physical currency gives you privacy in the transaction. And the CBDC has been, it's been designed so that it, it can give you privacy too. But but this is, CBDC is malleable enough that, that you can, it, it also works in the, just like a bank deposit does if you, if you wanna use it that way. Uh, and, you know, so think of those, you know, the one minus row fraction of transactions, those are things like online transactions and whatnot, where you can use this, you could use potentially, potentially use CBDC and, uh, and claims on banks interchangeably, okay. Uh, so that's going to that's going to be important. <clears throat> okay, there's take it or leave it offers in the decentralized market, uh, and uh, and then the buyer the buyer is going to learn at the end of the centralized market. That's like when, what happens when the you know the, the withdrawals get made from from uh, from banks. Uh, they know what kind of seller they're going to meet in the uh, in the uh, subsequent decentralized market. And that's private information. So in this, <laughs> that's gonna be important for the, for the banking panic that the, you, the bank doesn't know your, doesn't know your type. Okay. Uh, okay, so here's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna do, do two regimes. Our first one is, is uh, there's, you know, gonna, part of it's gonna look like the world we live in, more or less. Uh, It'll be physical currency and no, no, uh, no digital currency issued. Then, then we'll then we'll suppose that the central bank withdraws the physical currency from circulation, replaces it with digital currency, and ask what happens. And then, you know, in each of those cases, so, so we're going to have what? We're going to have like six different cases here, I guess. I always do this. I don't know why. <laughs> I end up with, I end up with a bunch of cases to work through. Then people get bored with it. Sometimes they get bored thinking about all these multiple, multiple things. Anyway, but that's what happens here. Anyway, so so we're going to think about in each case. We're going to think about a case with, with no kind of, nothing that looks like like some any kind of intervention by the. By anybody that's gonna that's trying to mitigate these these uh, banking panics that could potentially happen, other than conventional policy. So you'll see that that actually matters. And actually, it's actually going to matter for whether you're going to have a have a uh, have a banking panic equilibrium or not. Then we're going to think about deposit insurance. So it'll be a deposit insurance system where where the uh, you know. Viable banks, you know, uh, uh, pay in pay deposit insurance premium, and then and that's going to finance finance uh, payouts to to depositors and failing banks. Uh, then we'll load on top of the on top of the deposit insurance some kind of uh, emergency open market operations. Uh, previous version of the paper, I had some like. Uh, there was uh, like emergency central bank lending in here too. They took that, and not that it's not kind of interesting, but I, you know, it's like too much to <laughs> too much to worry about. 
and you kind of get the story with the emergency open market operations anyway. Okay, so here's the here's a baseline case. So you so this this is like um, this is the case where you got you got uh, central bank issuing physical physical currency, and we'll start with this case where there's no there's no intervention. The only the only central bank intervention here is just just uh, setting a gross nominal interest rate on government bonds that they're going to target with open market operations and uh, and uh, other, other, that's 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 a policy. Fiscal policy is not going to you know the, the way the way it's set up won't won't matter in this in this setup. Okay, so so here's the bank's problem. So banks banks choosing a a deposit contract. So that's like a, a K, C, and D. K is the that's the amount of the deposit you make. Actually, the minus. I was teaching this to my students the other day. I really there's a typo in there. So I forgot the, the minus K inside the curly brackets should be right is missing. So that's the, the you make the. Uh, depositor makes a deposit of goods, and then the uh, and then the bank is just like a, it's like a, a monitored a monitored creditor, you know. And, and it, except that you're you're going to these uh, these uh, uh, these bank depositors going to are going to trade the trade the bank's debt. That's what makes it look like a bank. So the the uh, uh, so the yeah so the deposit contracts the amount you deposit K the amount of currency C the that the bank acquires in the centralized market in real terms and the amount of the quantity of deposit claims D that the bank that the depositor has claims to if they don't withdraw so if a withdrawal happens then all these all these depositors show up simultaneously at the bank at the end of the centralized market and request withdrawal. And then the, the bank can't observe their types. And then what it does is it, it, the bank just distributes <laughs> distributes this the, the currency it has uniformly across the people who want to withdraw. So what's going to happen here is that well, so so we're going to think about you know, all these different possibilities that. Uh, so what we can have in here is we can have a uh, an equilibrium with no panics. That's this eta equals zero. So eta is the fraction of people who would like would you know normally use deposits in transactions uh, who choose to choose to withdraw. So they're going to get a bit, a bit of a bad deal because uh, if you choose if you if you need the deposits to make a transaction and you withdraw cash, you don't get to make a transaction. You're going to you just get to hold the currency as a store of value until the, until the next period. Uh, but in a panic equilibrium, you, you're going to choose to do that. That will be once you, when you see the sunspot variable that you'll you'll make a calculation and say, oh, "I'm in better off running to the bank and getting you know withdrawing currency." Okay, so so in the in the objective function there, that's the expected utility of the. Of the depositor, there's probability delta that the, the uh, this bad bad aggregate state occurs, and then uh, probability rho that in that state I may um, I may that's uh, up here probability rho that I may uh, I may uh, depositor who needs who needs currency, so for sure I withdraw I withdraw. I want to withdraw currency, but but uh, but there's going to be rho plus one minus rho eta uh, people withdrawing. They we split up the currency among them, and, you know, and you take the currency to the centralized market and trade it for trade it for goods. This is how much you get. Uh, and there's you know the probability one minus rho, one minus rho eta. That I withdraw if I'm a you know somebody who needs deposits and transactions. Then I just hold you know this is what the payoff I get by just holding the currency until the until the uh, till the uh, till the next centralized market. Then what is it you know and then we got probability one minus delta rho. This is for the 
cases where what the the uh, you're in the you're in the you're in the good state. Uh, I need currency, and this is my payoff. I won't explain that. Then there's a, then there's everything else, which is the this here is the this is the probability uh, for a uh, uh, bank depositor who need, they need the deposits to make a transaction. This is the probability that the that the bank doesn't fail. Uh, and then they then they get this payoff. Yep. That's a clarifying question. Yep. So in the bank's problem, are you ruling out um, like suspension contracts, or would it be pointless in this environment uh, to have something like a, a suspension? Yeah. No. Yeah. You don't. You don't gain anything from suspension here. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So then, then this is subject to a couple of constraints. So the first one is is like. Uh, the VT, that's that's the the uh, the bank's franchise value essentially. So you know, that's going to be gamma in equilibrium. That's going to be equal to the entry cost. Uh, what's on, what's here is their the bank's current payoff plus you know discounted franchise value from next period. So in here is like the probability they don't fail, and that's going to be greater than or equal to this V bar. That's a market. Value, but in, in equilibrium, that's gamma. Okay, and then the second thing is just the uh, is just uh, the the uh, incentive constraint for the for the bank. You, said, you know, this has to hold for it to want to pay off on its on its uh, deposit liabilities. So it's it it behaves well because it's because of it's got uh, it's got this fran future franchise value that it's, that it's worried about. Actually, can, can I uh, follow up a little bit on that just to clarify uh, my understanding of the model? So you, you have several banks in the economy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. And, yeah. and a depositor has multiple accounts, uh, an account at only one bank. Or... Yeah, but, I mean, that's important, yeah. Uh, the, 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 uh, you, the environment's such that you're, you're, you're only gonna, you're only gonna deal with one bank. It's important that you not diversify. The depositor is not diversify across. So across. if you were to embed a suspension clause, then the reason why that won't work is because uh, there will be some depositors that desperately need the cash. And yeah. by suspending, you're going to really hurt them, I guess. Is that the... Yeah. So the, you know, it's, it's not like Diamond did big where you're where by suspending, you're preventing something bad from happening. Well, by suspending, I mean, you're just going to, for one period, not permit them to with, make the withdrawal. You yeah. may permit them to make the withdrawal in the next period. You just want to delay it because you want to prevent the sunspot from becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, this is how yeah. I think about it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense in this model. But... Yeah. So I, hadn't, you know, I don't think more about the suspension. So, I, you know. So, so thank you. Uh, now you mentioned it. I'm not, yeah, now I'm not sure, but yeah. Yeah, I I I, I would know. probably about no, no, that. Because yeah, because the because yeah, the suspension's tricky because it's like you're not. Yeah, it's like the, the there isn't sequential service here, so there's there's not. Yeah. Sorry, I got to go on. I don't, I don't want to sit and think about it. I'm starting to think about it now. <laughs> okay. All right, so on we go. So, so here's the here's what results you get. So no intervention, and so what we're going to get is there's this. What's part of what's going to matter is this alpha. So probably you know you you see this sun bad sunspot, and then then you know your bank's failing with alpha probability. If alpha is small enough, so this condition holds, then you, you never you'll never get a banking panic equilibrium, and. Uh, and you, you know, it's actually, you know, you'll, it's just standard Friedman rule kind of economy. You want to go, nominal interest rate should go to zero. Interesting case is this one. So alpha is large enough that, that this condition holds, and then you'll get, uh, you'll get banking panic equilibria. So, so like low, low nominal interest rate, you'll get, you'll get these panic equilibria where everybody runs. And there's a middle range for the nominal interest rate where you'll, where you'll get, uh, some people run and some don't, and they're indifferent. And then there's a, then 
interest rates high enough and, and you, get, you get no panics. Uh, here's a picture of it. <laughs> so the, this is like an example. This is a, a constant relative risk aversion example. And here's alpha, the, uh, the, the probability of uh, an individual bank fails given a failure event. And this is the nominal interest rate. There'll be this whole re this region here where you get no panics and get panics down here, you get partial panics in the middle. Uh, okay, then we add deposit insurance. So the key thing here is we're gonna add another incentive constraint. How come? Because this is for the states of the world where the deposit insurance comes into effect. So this is where... Steve, you have uh, five minutes. Okay, yeah. so... So what happens here is that uh, it's like all the viable banks pay enough deposit insurance premium to finance the payments to the depositors in the, in the failing banks. Uh, but all that stuff, go, you know, all that goes into the incentive constraint. The, 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 the uh, deposit insurance premium go into the incentive constraint. So, but ADA goes in there too. That's the number of people that run to the bank. That, that's actually that's actually good for this. It relaxes the constraint because that's people who have withdrawn and they don't, you know, they're not going to, they don't need the deposit liabilities. So uh, anyway, the the uh, but if if you you want, you know, it's it's like you you can make this this constraint bind with with alpha large enough if ADA is zero. So. So what happens here is this deposit insurance maybe does what you think it would in part, and that it, it kind of, it shrinks the region of the parameter space where the, where the panics, where you get the panics, but it's not gonna eliminate them. You'll, you'll get something like this. You'll get, uh, you kind of enlarge this region where you don't get any panics, but it's still a region where you get partial panics. You don't get rid of them entirely. Uh, where's the open market operations? What happens here? Let's see. So this actually, relative to the just deposit insurance, it actually tends to encourage panics. It can, it's like it's like uh, making the bank's assets more liquid. It's got government bonds that it can it can trade in for currency, and then and then it uh, it actually makes the panics more more likely. Uh, but 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 mitigates the pan, you know, it mitigates the damaging effects of the panic. So it kind of cuts both ways. And then you kind of get this where the nominal interest rate doesn't matter for the panic. Okay, so I got like probably a minute or something to tell you about the CBDC case. So in this case, kind of what matters is, uh, is this ratio of the gross nominal interest rate on government debt to the gross nominal interest rate that the central bank's paying on the digital currency. So, so that, that's the relevant monetary policy variable here, the conventional monetary policy variable. So what happens here is, it, in fact, it's true that the, the darn uh, the CBDC promotes panics in the sense that it kind of it expands the region where you're going to get the partial panics. and and uh, there shouldn't be no panics. That's panics down here. Let's get rid of this no. This is panics down here. So it, it expands that region. Uh, and, you, but, and you're gonna get the same flavor of results in that the high interest rate economy is one where you can eliminate the panics, but you won't, you won't necessarily choose to. So if you're choosing an optimal conventional monetary policy, uh, you may actually wanna live with the panics because they're, they're in this case, they're less disruptive because of CBDC. It was true before too with the currency that you, 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 could, you could eliminate the panics, but you may not wanna do it because you're, you're kind of trading off two things. It's like higher interest rates, you know, distort things and, and uh, give you a welfare loss and panics are disruptive and give you a welfare loss and you'd trade off the two things. Could be you'd, you're willing to live with the panics. You want policy to, I don't know, be set so you tolerate the panics. Uh, here's here's everything in there. You know the well the de deposit insurance, deposit insurance, and CBDC issue gives you the same flavor of results, but it's it's an even smaller region where you get the you get the panics. 
uh, you throw everything in and then you, you know, with the, the CBDC and, uh, and deposit insurance and emergency open market operations, that'll actually give you multiple equilibria. You're just like the, the, the people would be different across these equilibria, but the, it actually, it actually, the, there, there are some cases like the, the policies will, 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 will give you multiple equilibria, even though in the, the fundamental thing with no, uh, with no intervention, you didn't, you know, you get, you get determinacy. Okay, so it's kind of a different model if you're thinking about thinking about banning, banking panics. Things are driven by this self-fulfilling drop in confidence in the banking system that gives you uh, insolvency of some banks and the insolvency can produce the, produce the panics. Uh, CBDC, that can incur, it, it can do what people, some people think it does, you know, which is in the model, you know, it's, which is that it can encourage panics, but the panics are less disruptive. Uh, so in fact, you know, so it'll be true that a, an economy that has panics may, may actually perform better than one that doesn't have them. Uh, deposit insurance improves welfare in here, you know, just like we think it does in reality, but it, uh, or maybe not, but it, but it need not eliminate banking panics. So that's a little different too. So it's like the, the, uh, the deposit insurance, the reason why you can't eliminate the panics had to do with the tightening the incentive constraints for the banks. So it's sort of, it's different from the usual notion of the things that go wrong with deposit insurance, which typically have to do with, with, uh, moral hazard. Okay, so that's that's it. Thanks. I went I went over here. Sorry. Thank you, Steve. Uh, our our discussion is Russell Wong. So uh, okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So uh, so uh. Or see the slide, right? Okay. Um, so uh thank you for uh inviting me to discuss Steve's paper. So people may know Steve uh, was my advisor more than a decade ago. So uh discussing his paper is like uh fighting Yoda. <laughs> so uh I, 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 this talk will be more like an appreciation of, of Steve's work, uh, and then I will provide some of my uh, understanding and and uh what will be interesting to do. Uh, more, more on the empirical side. So uh, I think it's a very typical style of Steve uh, work uh, in, in this literature. So it's always start with some policy discussion and then using a simple, elegant model to frame the story. So it is a very perfect example. I encourage everyone to read it carefully uh, and understand the discussion and the policy implication behind. So let, let me quickly go through the, the main read result of this paper. So it is a typical Lagos, right? So there will be two kinds of the uh, DM meeting. So uh, you can think about it as a risk in using payment. So with probability rule, you have to use currency. With probability one month rule, you can use the bank IOU. So you can think of it as a monitor meeting. So uh, what the bank is essential is the bank can provide a deposit contract to pull the payment risk among agents. So if you need to use currency, come to the bank and withdraw currency. So if you uh, can use the bank IOU, then come to the bank and wait later, the bank will issue IOU to use and the bank will pay it back in the next year. So here is the how bank is essential in this environment. So like, like David asked before, so you can think about it, there is a lot of banks, so they are highly competitive. So banks are offered the uh, utility maximizing contract to household, but bank has limited commitment. So uh, then there will be an incentive constraint to pay back the IOU in the coming CM, you can think about it. Uh, but in, in the model, it's not binding. You can think about it, uh, the cost, entry cost is sufficiently high. So the charter value is high in the equilibrium. You never, you always want to pay back IOU. So uh, then this means that uh, for the type B meeting, which I call the bank IOU meeting, so it's always the first bank. So it's very simple. Simplify a lot of the algebra. It's a very clean result of, of that. Uh, for the type A meeting, which uh, you have to use currency, so uh, the, the level of trade supported by the contract will be decreasing 
in the nominal interest rate R of B. But it is a very standard Lagos, right? So uh, when the nominal interest rate is higher, then that means you want to put uh, less cash or less currency in bank or in household. Then that's why the level of the type A meeting will be low. So the opportunity cost of using cash is higher. So then that's why the level of trade is lower. But there is something interesting uh, from this insight uh, uh, that will driving the banking panel. So in, in this case, so, but bear in mind, so high interest rate will have a, a, a lower currency. But it's tip, very typical Lagos rate. So what is a uh, uh, bank run in this paper? So a uh, bank run will be like the sunspot IID. Um, there will be two kind of events. So if we realize with uh with the best day, so uh which happened with probability delta. So a random fraction alpha of the band will die. Uh, but the household, they don't know which band will die. And it is very important. So it creates some risk and then uh, some incentive for you to run the band because you don't know. Now everyone knows that uh, the state is bad. And, and alpha of the band will die in the next TM. They are not going to pay back the IOU. But, but the seller knows it. So they won't accept the IOU in the next uh, TM. So uh, then in this case, you may be a little bit more precautionary to run the bank to cash out the, the currency instead of sitting on the IOU and then waiting for the rejection from the seller because they know which bank will fail. And uh, with another event, when the sun spot turn out to be stage G, so every uh, surviving bank will keep surviving uh, going to the next year. So uh, it generates attention. Alpha will capture something like the financial stability, but it is a kind of exogenous given, uh, have nothing to do with the policy. But it will clean the uh, algebra very, very nicely as well. So there will be uh, uh, actually three types of equilibrium, but, but in general, it's two types. So one is a panic equilibrium. And it just means that when the best day happens, everyone realize, okay, shit. So uh, some people will run the bank. Uh, and all the Thai fee household will withdraw the currency. They, uh, and then now the private information is important because the bank, they never know whether you're Thai Bay or Thai B. So in the panic equilibrium, every Thai B agent, so will mean make the Thai A one. And then they go to the bank, withdraw the currency because they are thinking other Thai B uh, uh, agent will also withdraw it. So that is very nice because uh, you don't need the sequential service constraint can generate a bank run equilibrium. It's just more like a coordinate attack uh, uh, in the currency attack, that kind of thing. So, uh, and in, there will also exist another equilibrium, which is no panic. That in this case, all the Thai B agent uh, will wait and then are uh, using the band IOU in their DM meeting, even though they observe the state is bad. So, uh, and what is CBDC in this model? So CBDC will be a, a very powerful medium of change, which you can always use for both type A and type B. So uh, the, the result in this paper is that issuing CBDC will make the panic equilibrium more likely, but there will be a lower welfare loss when the run hand. So then you can see a trade-off. So uh, issuing CBDC uh, uh, is good because uh, now you encourage people to run. So in the old day, if you are the Thai B agent, so uh, there's no need, there's not much use for you to withdraw the currency because uh, your meeting require a bank IOU. So the only use for you is uh, to sit on to the next CF. But now with CBDC is useful because you can withdraw the CBDC and use it as a payment. So that's why it creates a more incentive for you to run the bank. In the old day, uh, withdrawing currency is no use for you. You cannot use it as a payment. But now you withdrawing CBDC is good for you. You can make it for the payment. Uh, but because you can have a more use for the CBDC, that's why the welfare loss is lower. So then you can see the trade-off between uh, financial stability uh, and, uh, and, and, and more, more efficiency in the sense of the lower welfare. So that is the big picture uh, of, of the steep paper. So uh, I don't want to abuse your time to go through the detail. But I, later on, I will talk about the deposit inflow. So, uh, um, um, so this is the graph uh, Steve also showed before. So, uh, but I want to uh, uh, make clear before why bank run happen in this model. So, uh, in particular, in uh, why low interest rate uh, will encouraging more bank run. So the idea is very simple. So, uh, when the interest rate is low, bank want to hold more currency. 
then that means you encourage people to run the bank because you can get more bank when you successfully attack the bank. So, uh, but that is also means that something like the typical uh, liquidity coverage ratio of Basel III is a bad idea. So whenever the bank have more liquid assets, you are encouraged more attack because when the attack is successful, people can get more uh, uh, from the bank run. So here's the idea. So why the low interest rate, you will promote uh, more liquid access holding of the bank that will make the run uh, more profitable and make the bank run more likely. So here is the mechanism uh, uh, behind uh, uh, the, the steep paper. So, so why bank run of curve and in particular uh, the trade off with the CBDC in this case. So liquid asset is not good uh, in, in this model uh, from the uh, financial stability perspective. So uh, then let's see a little bit about the data. So it is the typical uh, age, age data uh, by, by weekly from the uh, Board of Governor and the FDIC. So what did the data say about this mechanism? So I, I hope you can see the, the legend and, and the each uh, chart it represents. So the blue line will be the number of bad historically have failed. So you can see there are mainly three uh, uh, episodes, so which is the Great uh, uh, Depression around 1933, and the saving and, and loan crisis, which is around 1980, and, and the great, uh, uh, great Depression around 2007 to 2010. So, um, so according to the model, so uh, the more likely for the bank run or more bank will fail, should be uh, correlated with the lower interest rate, right? So which I put the red line. So the red line will be the secondary fee month TB rate, so which is the standard measure uh, in, in this literature for the nominal interest rate. Um, and the correlation between red line and the blue line is actually poor. Uh, you can see uh, uh, why it is so. So uh, actually there is uh, some lead lag relationship uh, between the red one and the blue one. So when the red ones, uh, which is the free bill, uh, three month TV rate was high, then it uh, it failed right here. So it will follow some uh, uh, bank run episode, like uh, uh, in the 80 for the for the saving and the loan prices, uh, and later on. And of course, uh, the relationship is not that strong because the policy is endowed. Right? So uh, when there's a recession come, the natural reaction for the monetary policy is to reduce the interest rate. So we can see very clearly uh, after 2007, 7, 8, so we reduced the long interest rate to almost zero. The same thing uh, in the Great uh, 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 Depression, uh, uh, in the, uh, 1933. Um, so um, so, so the, the data is not, not that clear. So it, it seems to suggest the mechanism, um, maybe something else uh, in the data. And in particular, so again, so the mechanism why uh, there will be a ban run because the ban holding too much liquid assets and encourage people to run the ban to attack it, to, to coordinate attack. And then uh, the green line is putting the uh, ratio of liquid assets uh, as a share of the ban total uh, assets. So a liquid assets, I, I want you to have an apple to apple comparison to the model, including the bond cash and the reserve. So uh, then you can see um, before the uh, uh, 2008 crisis, so the share of the super liquid asset is declining. And after the crisis, so uh, the Fed moved to the floor system, we ingest tons of the reserve in the system. So uh, you see the green line becomes jumping up a lot so, uh, from 2% uh, from to uh, close to 15%. Uh, so Fed holding a more and more liquid asset. Um, but uh, at the same time, so uh, we, we don't quite see um, a loss of the band fail uh, uh, after the crisis. So, uh, this is also interesting because at the same time, we also see less band entry as well. So maybe part of the reason why less band fail because there are less band uh, available in, in the banking market anymore. But it's just something uh, in, in the data. So maybe there's another mechanism why band fail. So uh, what did the uh, empirical banking literature say about it? And, I think uh, Steve put it very upfront that okay, the bank run model is more like the gray uh, uh, depression model, uh, very, uh, maybe the uh, national banking era, uh, that kind of the, of the story in mind. Um, 
we, we have a long list of the empirical banking literature uh, try to uh, provide some early warning or predicting the uh, wide band fail. So uh, what will be the typical uh, finding they have? If it's super robust, so uh, you can have uh, tons of different uh, specification. And the data is very good. So we have the core report data, we have the FDIC data. And, and the typical reason for why band fail um, uh, in the data is that either the equity is too low, so uh, the band uh, doesn't have enough capital, so they are too rely on deposits. And, and the second reason, maybe the bad performance loss, maybe the MBS or the local market uh, economic performance is not good. So a lot of band loan uh, turns sour. Or the low profitability, so measured by the ROA, the, uh, the returns of assets or the uh, net interest margin, uh, the interest rate spread between the deposit and, and the loan rate. So uh, these three uh, key factors are usually highly predict why a bank fails. So rather than the bank run uh, per se, according to the data. And, and, and people like, like, like David asked before, so um, uh, maybe it is just because we have deposit insurance and a better and better regulation now, then uh, we, we shouldn't need to worry about the bank run anymore. So, uh, and uh, FDIC provide a very nice uh, case study for every uh, failed bank. So uh, when a bank fails, so it will release a, a, a press release saying about, okay, what is happening? Uh, what are the reasons? What the FDIC do? So this bank is the most recent uh, failed bank uh, 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 reason in, uh, in October 2020. So I, I highlight uh, in red the reason why this bank failed. So this bank failed because it experienced a long lasting capital, which means the equity is too low and the asset quality is, uh, is bad. So uh, the number two reason. So again, so uh, I just want to emphasize, okay, the maybe the more modern uh, um, financial stability risk is not about bank run anymore because we um, very rare to see bank run anymore. In, in this country, maybe in other parts of the world, it is still the main issue. But it seems to suggest that the, maybe the main uh, financial stability or the risk uh, in, in the banking market in particular is about low equity ratio, uh, bad performance loans, uh, or low profitability. The banking competition may be too high for, for the last year. Uh, so Russell, rather than the bank one per se. One minute. Yeah, so I'm going to explain this. So then uh, 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 that is something, um, so, but in, in steep model, so there's bank, uh, there's a deposit insurance and the deposit insurance cannot kill the bank one. So why is it the case? Because uh, uh, the setting of deposit insurance in the steep model is a survival pay. So uh, then there will be an incentive contract because if you survive, you may not want to pay to bail out other the failed bank anymore. And then this contract is binding. And that limits the role of deposit insurance in the steep market. Then you cannot kill all the run if you need them. But there may be actually some tension about uh, what in reality the FDIC work and in the model. So in, in, in reality, so the FDIC uh, pay the uh, deposit premium according to your level of your asset, your balance sheet, rather than the deposit size. Uh, and moreover, um, most of the time, so the FDIC fund is not used uh, to, to bail the deposit. So um, more likely the FDIC will work like a middleman to, to broker the trade of the failed bank to sell it to some uh, uh, survival bank. So um, most of the case of FDIC is to, as a bridging bank to, to form a transaction between the failed bank and the, uh, and the survival bank. So, uh, and then in this case, all the deposit will be, will be taken care of by the acquiring bank in, in this case. So uh, I don't have time, but uh, I will quickly go through. So um, there is some issue at, at David mentioned. So uh, what happens if you allow suspension? So um, so a typical story with limited commitment, like 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 Paul and and, and Michael Lee, uh, who better owners have an AER. So it may be an issue when they have limited commitment. So suspension may have some other implication. And if you allow, so in, another thing is that in the contract, it's not contingent on Sun's fault. Or for some reason, maybe there are some people structure preventing the bank to issue the contingent contract. But we know that if you have a visual contract, you can kill the run if you leave. Uh, like uh, Bruno, my, my colleague, uh, and David have a paper on that. So uh, let, let me conclude. So uh, maybe last minute. So I think it's a super nice paper to understand 
what is the CBDC implication on financial stability? And what should we say about the interaction between the regulation, like the Basel III, uh, and the macro potential policy? Uh, in the United States, we don't have, uh, we don't have the counter cynical uh, buffer for that one. Maybe there's something good, uh, like, like the Steve X. Um, and, and it seems to me um, the model instead is more like a shadow bank, maybe more like a bilateral repo or the money market mutual fund. Uh, in this case, because we still see that kind of bank run uh, in the last uh, crisis. So maybe that is another interpretation rather than the traditional um, banking industry. And, and I said before, maybe the more modern uh, mechanism of why bank fail is about um, the equity rather than the deposit slide. So um, maybe there is a role for the bank equity, which is no role in the steam model right now. Uh, we are looking to see the next version uh, maybe there is some, uh, uh, some element for the bank equity. And uh, maybe for interest rates, low bank will search for you, then that may explain why you have the uh, uh, bad performance loan in the first place. So another channel why low interest rate is bad because it, it encourages banks to search for you. Uh, and, and a typical drawback or pushback for the deposit insurance is a moral hazard. So uh, I know I will bail out, so it encourages banks to do more risk taking. So uh, deposit insurance could be bad. Uh, I think Steve mentioned that in his talk too. So uh, the, the typical channel of the deposit insurance uh, will be go through the more half a channel as well. Uh, and, and finally, um, so this paper is focused Russell, on- do you want to uh, leave Steve some time to respond? Uh, maybe- Yes, yes. So- uh, uh, talk last, afterwards. Last sentence, uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, so uh, this paper focuses on the payment role of the bank, but we also know our bank does uh, uh, maturity transformation, providing insurance of the funding needs, and also for the uh, delegated monitoring or screening. So it may be also see uh, what this kind of role will matter for the CBDC implication on the financial sector. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Steve, do, do you want to uh, respond to Russell's discussion? Yeah, sure. So. And the one point about, I guess, the things to do with uh, bank failures. So, so it's a you know, model it's not designed to be a you know, model of telling you why banks fail. Is, you know, given the given that everything's driven by these by these sunspots, you know, it just does, doesn't have a chance there. You know, so but the but then the the idea is that if you I don't know, you know, suppose we. Try to try to expand this thing and 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 uh, try to try to address why why it is bank fail banks fail you know they fail for you know kind of uh, their regularities in, in the in the data in terms of in terms of bank failures and you know would would suggest what 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 uh, what explains why a bank fails uh, you know so perhaps you, you you take you take you take those things build them into a model like this and then then. You know, and then that 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 drives the panics in the in the same way potentially. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. But you know, I you know, it 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 it, it could it could work in the in the same way. There was a you know, David was asking about like the like suspension. So I was thinking a bit about that. There is there is a form of suspension here because what happens is the the bank always exhausts its uh, its uh, its currency. You know, maybe it can get more because it's you know because of the because of the central bank intervention, et cetera. Et cetera. So the uh, but but what happens in what happens in equilibrium is that the uh, you know these states where you have the bank panics, there's everybody gets everybody gets less currency. So there's a some some element of suspension. Now the question is you know so whether whether I've been sufficiently general about the contract. Could you? Design another contract that would that would somehow mitigate the mitigate the panics. Is it, is it, you know is it, or, or, you know the, the contracts restricted somehow in a way that uh, that's uh, you know that's that's helping to helping to give you the panics. The question is whether the whether the whether the bank would 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 ever choose that if there is such a thing. And I mean, I'm not sure that there's. Not absolutely sure there 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 is you know but uh, you know, but that 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 would be the that would be the question. One advantage of this setup is you know see is that uh, and in fact the 
the the bank anticipates the panic. The bank it actually it does mitigate the it it behaves in a way to try to try to mitigate the effect of the panic. So so there's uh there's there's that. So you get this this panic equilibrium where where the you know once in a while they happen and uh, but the the bank is the bank the, Designs its, you know, its structure so that it 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 can it can partly mitigate the their their effects. Uh, anyway, so the other questions to do with you know I don't know models of bank equity and whatnot. That's pretty complicated. You know, trying to get together the whole. It's like for any you know any kind of financial structure for anything is is it's like a is a is a is a potentially potentially difficult difficult thing that we're always trying to grapple with, I guess, you know, I guess we, you know, work needs to be done. I guess that's about all you can say. Well, uh, can I ask a question here? <laughs> uh, of course. Yeah, on your, on your, um, your point about whether or not you've explored, um, you know, uh, if, if you've restricted yourself to a, a, a class of contracts, that the answer is almost surely you have. I mean, uh, and, and that's fine, but I just want to report after years of kind of working on this with Ed and, and more recently with Bruno. I mean, what, we, what, what I typically find is if you think hard enough and you consider a, a broad enough set of contracts, you know, you can usually design something, you know, do mechanism design, you know, you can usually kind of implement uh, an allocation uh, uh, uniquely. And, uh, and, then, and then the question uh, usually turns to, oh my God, this contract looks so freaking uh, complicated and so at odds with what the type of contractual arrangements we see in reality. And so then the question is, is like, what, what, are there any properties of the environment that kind of uh, uh, restrict us from actually seeing these types of contracts uh, arising in equilibrium? That, that's kind of like what I've discovered in, in this literature. Um, but I had two questions for you quickly, uh, just in terms of uh, you, your, one of your conclusions was FDIC did not prevent runs, uh, but did you, uh, did you, I, I might have missed it, but did you consider lender of last resort uh, operations, because that seems like that would do it. Oh, yeah, 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 I did that, they, they had like another version of this thing, mm -hmm. so I just didn't, I didn't want to include it because it was like too much stuff, but, but right. you can do that, so, there, so I had like the, I was sort of interested in this question of whether uh, you know, people have thought about this before, you know, whether it's like in a, in a, in a financial crisis, what, this should, what should the central bank do? Should it just kind of flood the market with liquidity or, uh, like through open market operations or, or, or should, the, should, it, uh, should it do direct lending like through, the, through, the, through the direct lending through the, through the discount window? So, so I, could, you know, I, could, I could sort of do that. So I could say, oh, well, the central banks got some some uh, got more information than these these depositors are so it can lend to the could lend to the uh, to the solvent banks and not to the insolvent ones and then I'd ask you know what 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 happens there so that was you know it was kind of interesting you know but but it, it didn't add so much relative to the you know thinking about the I'm, I'm operations. think think of a policy where the central bank just says forget it and in a, in a run I'm just gonna I'm just gonna lend to everybody um, and then oh, and everybody. for the moment, I mean, just suppose they do that. Not, let's not ask if it's optimal, but if they do that, yeah. there's no reason for anybody to run. They, they don't care if they have a bad bank or a good bank. That type of that. policy should eliminate the, uh, the self-fulfilling nature of that run. Uh, and then, then we can go back and ask, well, actually, if the, bank, if the central bank did adopt that policy, and if it was credible, There'd be no reason to run, uh, and actually, that that policy would never actually be implemented. Uh, I mean, you'd never actually see the run, so the bank, central bank, would never actually pay off. Is yeah, I don't know. Yeah, if that's I, quite, I don't know if that's true here necessarily. Okay. So this is a, a very textbook Keynesian view of central bank behavior. What can the central <laughs> yeah, bank do? Textbook. Yeah, it is. <laughs> the central bank prints a bunch of currency and gives it away. You know, oh, you know, threatens, you threatens, no, Randy, Randy, Randy threatens to give it away. It doesn't what? give it away in equilibrium. No, no, the point is off the equilibrium path. If you, if the central bank prints currency and gives it away, the price level goes up and everybody's left with real balances they had before. 
No, so but you you have to talk, you, know, you have to think the about the incentive of the guy to run. He doesn't care about the price level effect. All he knows is he's going to get yeah. uh, his money back. Okay. Yeah, this the is, general principle know. here is: Can the central bank create liquidity? I don't know. Can they can they create currency? Yes. Does creating currency have any real effects? No. So that's the general. <laughs> okay. Let me uh, say to Steve: This idea <laughs> that low interest rates are bad for financial stability. That's I first learned that up in your paper with Rao. If you have low inflation, it gives uh, in the credit market less incentive to honor your debt because punishment is you lose credit, you have to use cash. Well, if you're close to the Friedman rule, it's not much of a punishment. Yeah. So maybe the mechanics are different, but it's the same flavor of result. You know, I don't mind if my bank fails because I can revert the currency. Is it related or is it just similar result? Well, that didn't yeah, geez, I don't know if that's the same or not. So it was, uh, that was like a, you got credit, yeah, you got credit contracts. And yeah, there's, yeah, there, there was this idea in there, yeah, of, of the flight, <laughs> the flight to currency that was bad for incentives. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so yeah, that's right. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, it kind of works like that. I hadn't thought of that. What, what paper was that? Jet it's paper. like an old thing. It's, it's uh, in the last century. Jet. Well, it was before, it was before Rao died, so you do the math. So, <laughs> oh, geez. What year was that? I can't remember what year it was. Long time Actually, ago. I think it came out after Rao died, but yeah. yeah. Rao is, you know what year it is this year, Steve? I do, well, I, I, I forget what day it is, let alone what year it is. I don't know what the hell. <laughs> Steve, I had another question, actually. Um, maybe at first I thought. Uh, there was, uh, the question, is, I'll just say it, I mean, is there any difference in your model uh, between a C, what you're calling a CBDC and say a government money fund? Uh, I, mean, I guess not. You know, and so if not, and then your, your propositions also apply, I guess, to money funds, uh, I suppose. Uh, Yeah, well, you know, the fact that money funds are, are more destabilizing, but that they mitigate the kind of worse effects of a crisis. I mean, I guess you could apply the same logic to, 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 to those. Yeah. Guess, yeah. Uh, now, they're not insured. They're not subject to deposit. No. Right. So that's that, that would actually might actually uh, help you identify one of your cases. Yeah. And then the banks would be the kind of insured case. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that either. Something there's, think. there's like a, a thing I could, yeah. <laughs> it's like a one, one solution in this thing, you know. So if you took the model literally now, you could, you could uh, an optimal arrangement would just be, you know, once you introduce the CBC, CBDC, given the assumptions I made about it, like a, a narrow bank, would be, that's, that's optimal. You know, yeah, yeah. You, just, you suck all the deposits out of the private sector and then it works really well. I didn't want to think about that because I, I wanted to, you know, it's like, uh, I think there are probably some, <laughs> probably some, some, uh, some costs of running the central bank relative to the private sector or something. And so I, I just assumed that, that the, uh, whenever, you know, when they introduced the CBDC that they had to, had to make it unattractive enough that, that, uh, that the, 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 the private banking sector would still survive, which meant uh, having like a low enough, low enough uh, interest rate on the on the digital currency. So I just assumed that you have to have that and go from there. Well, aren't, aren't your banks performing any essential function? I mean, uh, you wouldn't want to. You oh. said you mentioned something. It'd be optimal. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. There's the essential function. Yeah. So yeah. So I I kind I kind of eliminate to keep things simple. I kind of eliminated. Some of the essential functions of banking is not really what's it, you know it's not intermediating anything they're just they're just uh they're just creditors and people can use their use their liabilities and transactions there's the, the banks don't hold any assets right Wait, yeah you wouldn't want to face the banking lobby uh against cbdc with this paper then would you <laughs> perhaps not <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, it was interesting. Uh, and Russell, good, good discussion. So I guess um, maybe we should end the official part of the program. I want to thank Jonathan and you, Sue, for doing a lot of the organization here. And thank everybody for attending, you know, participants, discussions, and just uh, people who were sitting in. I thought it was a really good few days. It was not nearly as much fun as we could have if we could meet personally and talk about these ideas at more length over a couple of beers, but it was still quite productive and I learned a lot. So thanks everybody. I can't wait to do it again, hopefully in person. Thanks a lot, Randy. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, folks. All right.